program signed. We'll call the meeting to order. I declare this meeting open to the public. <clears throat> can I remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? And can I advise those in the public gallery that mobile devices may be used through a Wi-Fi connection and all devices should be muted? Password details are set out in the gallery rules for anyone wanting to connect to the Assembly's Wi-Fi network. 3G and 4G should not be used and no recordings or photographs are to be taken. So, uh, we have a full meeting this morning. Um, Chairperson's business then. Can I advise the committee that, as chair, I attended an, an endometriosis event this week in the Long Gallery? And it's an issue, I think, of, of some concern, and I think an issue that's under, under regarded and maybe could be doing with being a, a look at in a, for, in a forward work programme at some point, if members would be happy with that. Um, I met with Neve Louise and Dungannon, um, who provide regional services around suicide prevention. I met with myself and, and the Deputy Chair, met with Robin Emerson, who is a medicinal cannabis campaigner, and we also met with Shakira Ross and Phil Mines from Diabetes UK. Uh, I have agreed to speak at the launch of the Leonard Cheshire Alcohol Related Brain Injury Unit on the 22nd of April. And now, members, since the Minister is under time pressure, can I suggest that we move straight to the briefing and return to items three and four afterwards? Okay. So, can I advise members that the, the Minister of Health is here today to brief members on his department's priorities? So, I would like to welcome Mr. Robin Swan, Minister for Health, Mr. Richard Pengelly, Permanent Secretary and Dr. Michael McBride, Chief Medical Officer. So, Minister, I'd like to go ahead and invite you to brief the committee, please. Thank you very much, Chair. You're wasting no time, and I put it that way. <laughs> Listen, th thanks for that. Um, and first of all, but before I get into the formal presentation, can I thank the committee members for the support they have given me as Minister and the support they've given the Department through the difficult times that they have come into under the past six weeks due to COVID-19 and coronavirus. It has been helpful, um, and as I think as we are presenting a, a collegiate approach, department, ministerial levels, committee members, MLAs, I think it is the, re the responsible face of this place that the general public wants to see when we do come under pressure at times like this. So, uh, as I say, Chair, um, we are obviously here today in front of you in an ever-changing public health situation, and I will give members a brief update on recent local developments in relation to coronavirus. Um, we have moved to daily reporting of cases. Um, we release figures now each afternoon. Um, as confirmed, there are now 18 confirmed cases in Northern Ireland, and the contact tracing process for the latest cases is underway, and all appropriate actions will be taken quickly. The increase in positive cases is not unexpected, and I would advise members not to be unduly alarmed by these de developments, but to be alert. Uh, we have been planning for the first positive case in Northern Ireland and had robust infection control measures in place, which enabled us to respond immediately. The overall risk to individuals in Northern Ireland has not changed at this stage, and based on the advice of the UK Chief Medical Officers, the risk of the UK remains at moderate. We remain focused on the containment phase at this point, which is aimed at preventing the disease from taking hold here in Northern Ireland and across the United Kingdom. But we will consider the scientific evidence which will guide us in our next steps to flatten the peak of the outbreak in the UK, delay and spread the impact of our health service, to push that peak away from the time of year and to protect those who are at risk. But Chair, what I would say it is in all likelihood that we will move into the delay phase at some point. It's, it will be when and not if at this point in time. There's also been a rise of cases and members we aware in the Republic of Ireland, um, which I think currently stand at 32 confirmed cases, and that includes two cases of community transmission. And Chair, I think everyone's aware now that there was one fatality in the Republic of Ireland yesterday. So we would pass on our sympathies to the family at this moment in time, and we're aware that they have asked for for patient confidentiality while the family deals with with the loss of a loved one. But I will be clear, I think, to committee members as well in regards to where we are in Northern Ireland. We can also be expect to reach that point at some time as well, where we will see a bereavement in Northern Ireland in connection to COVID-19. So that's something that we've been preparing for as well. So this will be a staged approach. 
But um, in regards to the reaction, extensive work has been undertaken to ensure that all trusts now have COVID-19 pods in place, which will enable patients suspected of having COVID-19 um, to be assessed and, and samples taken. Um, away from routine hospital work, so we continue to review the best use of testing and current clinical pathways so that individuals receive their appropriate care, recognise that many patients will, will simply pre present with a mild illness. So my departments and its agencies will continue to work closely with the relevant authorities and the public health agencies across the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland to ensure that Northern Ireland is well placed and prepared to deal with the situation as events unfold. We can expect significant ongoing increases in the numbers of people testing positive for COVID-19 in Northern Ireland, and the same can be said for England, Scotland, Wales and the Republic of Ireland. Um, Chair, I will say to your members that health systems across the globe are currently coming under extreme and increasing pressure as this virus spreads. Ours will be no different. It is bound to take its toll. Normal, normal business in the health, health and social care will not be possible. Some activities will have to be scaled back. I know you have had a, a briefing from my senior officials on the Department of Health's priorities as well, um, from those arising from new decade, new approach documents. Um, so, as we move at this moment in time, um, I think from a department's point of view, COVID-19 and our approach to coronavirus will become our day job. So we will see a scaling back and a stepping back from what we have been doing as a department from a ministerial level as well and from officials' levels, where we have been trying to manage both in the transition phase as coronavirus transitions into I suppose, the wider society. So do we, and that bec start becomes our day job. So we will at some point be asked in members' indulgence as to how they work greater, I suppose, at a, the machinery of government level as to how they interact with us as a department and, and myself as Minister. So, um, in regards to the other priorities that we have, that work continues, but it won't continue at the same pace or the same intensity. So, I, I know you have had a briefing from my senior officials on the Department of Health priorities, including those arising from New Decade New Approach. Um, so I won't go into those areas within my opening statement, but I will happy to accept questions on these at a later date. But members, um, I don't think following yesterday, I can't ignore the, the elephant in the room, and that's our, our budgetary position. As you'll be aware, the UK Chancellor announced the budget yesterday, and I await the opportunity for the Minister of Finance and my executive colleagues to give consideration to this and agree the funding priorities within the Northern Ireland bloc. And it's about us positioning ourselves to make sure that you know we're positioned so that other ministers and other executive colleagues are, are listening to what we've been what we've been saying in regards to our budgetary needs. The 2021 budget with health and social care receives um, this what, what we receive this month will be crucial. My department is currently anticip anticipating a significant funding gap in 2021. Uh, a resource budget is at the current five point. <coughs> Five thousand seven hundred and fifty eight point eight million and that's a recurrent budget baseline and that will not be fully met um, that will not fully meet the forecast costs of the maintaining existing services. The total additional resource funding requirement for twenty twenty one is six hundred and sixty one million and that includes the hundred and seventy million already committed to by the executive for agenda for change pay parity with England and safe staffing. The absolute minimum additional funding requirement to meet the inescapable costs of maintaining existing service levels and agenda for pay change pay party is four hundred and ninety two million pound. However, this would not allow growth and transformation or the department to deliver on the further commitments that were set out in New Decade New Approach. So Chair, I want to be clear with you and with members that maintaining <coughs> existing service levels, what that means to existing service levels, it means another year of frustration and falling short of the public expectations, with gaps in provision and unmet need actually growing. In terms of our waiting list, it would allow a, a focus on red flag and urgent cases such as suspected cancer, but overall the current totally unacceptable waiting list position would be unlikely to improve. An additional 169 million is required to implement the health and social care commitments which were set out in New Decade and New Approach. And that 169 million includes much needed investment 
and enhancing and developing <coughs> services because it, co it covers, um, for, you know, for example, the vital funding for enhancing and performance our social care sector and growing the social care workforce and improving its pay levels. And you know, in terms of hospital waiting lists, this new decade new approach states that no one waiting over a year, we, there'll be no one waiting over a year the 30th of September 2019 for outpatient or inpatient assessment or treatment will still be on the waiting list by March 2021. The added pressures from coronavirus and COVID-19 that that puts on that target as well has to be taken in to consideration as well as the budget, because that, that that one commitment alone would cost in the region of £50 million, and it should be seen only as the first step in dealing with what was our waiting list crisis um, to get to a more sustainable position. So that will need sustained additional investment over future years to not only deal with backlogs, but bring about the much needed change. <coughs> I appreciate that there's some of the four hundred and ninety two million to maintain existing services and a further hundred and sixty nine million to meet new decade new approach commitments is a significant ask. However, I believe the public are entitled to demand more and better. I also acknowledge that the new decade new approach document has raised expectations significant significantly. There are deep seated problems across the health and social care system that will take years to put right. This will require major investment on a sustained basis along with the transformation reforms. So we need a multi-year funding commitment, which is necessary if health and social care services are to be put on a sustainable footing, because non-recurrent funding is not conducive to the kind of long-term investment that is required to deliver the new decade new approach commitments and delivering together transformation programmes. A commitment to a multi-year settlement which supports both 6 per cent annual growth and the recurrent incremental increases of £150 million per annum to support new decade new approach and transformation is therefore essential. It is also important that we have within the Department the flexibility to reprioritise and internally reallocate funding across health and social care whilst operating within the context of the commitments set out in the new decade new approach and in the programme for government which supports transformation. I am grateful that we have existing flexibility, which is accorded to my department, which allows me to internally reallocate the resource funding available to me. It is important that this flexibility is also applied to the additional funding provided to tackle the waiting list backlog and to support the delivery of new decade, new approach and the wider transformation. Um, Chair, moving on to our capital budget, my department's capital programme aims to facilitate the delivery of modern fit for purpose services, services through the provision of appropriate infrastructure. Our ability to transform the way we deliver our services is directly linked to the level of capital resources available. However, over the last number of <coughs> years, our capital needs have been considerably in excess of our budget allocations, and we have had to constrain our programme to match budget availability. This has led to a gradual deterioration of our existing facilities and a lack of investment in the modernisation that is needed to support changes in service delivery. Our existing capital programme therefore needs to balance the prioritisation of our ongoing major projects with the need to maintain our existing infrastructure. So, Looking to the future, um, over the last year my department has been undertaking some long-term capital planning, working with our stakeholders and our arm's length bodies to develop a draft 10-year programme for the period 2029-30. The work completed to date has been used to inform the information we have provided to the Department of Finance on our needs for the next four years. Our critical needs, which include a number of new projects where redevelopment cannot be delayed any further, indicates that we need just over £300 million in the financial year 2021. However, beyond that, the numbers increase, and it is clear that £300 million will not be sufficient in future years to meet these needs, let alone to begin any new investment to address the growing demand for our services or to transform the way that they are delivered. <clears throat> this applies to investments we would wish to make across all of our services, for example, in modernising our IT infrastructure, increasing emergency department and theatre capacity, investing in our emergency services, diagnostic equipment and primary and community care facilities. So, In particular, I want to mention mention our ageing mental health facilities, where there is a critical need to address the therapeutic environment currently provided 
for many of our most vulnerable patients. To do all of this will require not only an immediate increase in my capital budget, but a longer-term commitment which will enable me to transform how our services are delivered in the future. I have highlighted in several times already uh, in transformation, but our health and social care service needs to be transformed. Over three years ago, we embarked on an ambitious journey to transform health and social care services. The reason for starting that journey was understood by everyone in this room. We spread our resources and our expertise too thinly and across too many sites for it to be resilient and sustainable. On top of that, the demands upon our system continue to grow at a rapid, rapid rate. Our population is getting older and people are living longer with the more long-term health conditions. This presents a huge and growing challenge. Quite simply, our current service delivery model is no longer fit for purpose and there are significant challenges in attracting and retaining staff. That we still manage to deliver the high quality level of care that we do is testament to the hard work, dedication and compassion of our staff. And to be clear, that's all our staff. We work across health and social care. Everyone in our system makes a vital contribution to patient care. And that's why I'm committed to leading the work required with the support of my executive colleagues to fully implement our transformation strategy, which is Health and Wellbeing 2026, delivering together. Health and Wellbeing 2026, delivering together, is aligned with the aspirations set out within the Northern Ireland Executive's draft programme for government. But unlike other transfer- transformation projects, delivering together and its initial action plan was agreed by the Northern Ireland Executive with cross party support when it was launched in 2016. Importantly, it has provided health and social care with a 10-year roadmap for the transformation of health and social care services in Northern Ireland. Delivering Together seeks to radically reform the way health and social care services are designed and delivered in Northern Ireland, with a focus on person-centred care rather than on buildings and structures. Delivering Together recognises that transformation as a journey rather than the destination. It is an ir- irretrievable process a revertible process which will be co-produced to ensure that the needs of those who rely on and work within health and social care services inform, shape and are at the heart of this important change. Delivering Together also makes commitments to partnership working, <coughs> to investment in our workforce, to improving quality, to driving collective leadership and make, making better use of technology and data. As I said earlier, we are over three years into that journey but with strong foundations laid, but there is still much more to do. The speed at which it will be done will be determined by the resources available to deliver it. The scale of transformation change that is currently ongoing is immense, but the scale of transformative change that needs to be taken forward is even greater, and the financial challenges that this presents cannot be understated. As I have previously said, the Department's budget as it currently stands is insufficient to meet current demand. Rising, pressure, rising pressures are to systematically tackle the growing waiting list backlog with the added pressure of effective in year savings. In 2016, Delivering Together was agreed by the Northern Ireland Executive with cross party support, and recognition the transformation of health and social care services in Northern Ireland would require a period of double running. And what I mean by that is an additional recurrent investment over and above what is required to run existing services. As such, the pace of transformation will be determined by the level of funding available to maintain existing services, whilst at the same time running transformation in parallel. To support this transformation, £200 million was made available through the Confidence and Supply Agreement of 2018-2020. This has been successfully invested in over 170 initiatives. And whilst this Confidence and Supply funding has been a positive enabler, the result of the investment has impacted on the financial position for 2021, with an investment estimated at £150 million needed next year to continue and grow those initiatives which began over the last two years. And it is important to note that this £150 million figure, while supporting transformation, does not include any funding to stabilise waiting lists or to meet the waiting list commitments made with a new decade new approach, <coughs> the total figure of which is estimated to be circa £80 million next year. But we can't spend money we don't have, which means that we will continue to have to debate on priorities 
and how best to use the limited, finances, limited financial resources we have. The renewed commitment to health and social care transformation through new decade and new approach has reaffirmed delivering together as our roadmap for change. It has outlined a number of significant commitments which the Northern Ireland Executive has agreed to deliver for local people, including but not limited to further work on service reviews and additional nursing and midwifery undergraduate places. As I have said, we currently spread our resources too thinly to deliver resilient, sustainable services. Reviewing the configuration of hospital services is, for that reason, a priority in delivering together. Work is now ongoing to, beginning to begin to evaluate those projects which have been supported by transformation funding to understand their impact and their sustainability, a significant challenge in this already constrained financial environment. Most importantly, transformation is now moving to a new phase, from planning and foundation laying to implementation and building of a new, modern and sustainable system. This new phase will see stabilisation as well as reconfiguration and transformation running in parallel to business as usual. And these changes will present many challenges, operational challenges, strategic challenges and, of course, emotional challenges. Because we cannot hope to meet the challenges we face to transform the health and social care services by doing the same things we have always done in the same way we have always done them. The evolution of hearts and minds, as well as systems and structures, and difficult decisions will have to be made to enable the jigsaw pieces of transformation to come together. <coughs> Change means things are no longer the same, and that can be difficult for many of us to deal with. But it is necessary in order to have a system capable of meeting the needs of future generations. As the Bingo report stated, the stark options facing the health and social care system are either to resist change and see services deteriorate to a point of collapse over time, or to embrace transformation and work to create a modern, sustainable service that is properly equipped to help people stay as healthy as possible and to provide them with the right type of care when they need it. I very much welcome the prior priority attached to health by my executive colleagues. We are all facing up to the scale of the challenges in our departments, and I certainly owe it to patients and their families to be frank with them. <coughs> my ability to transform services and start reducing waiting times will be heavily dependent on the budget allocation received by my department this month. Chair, that is my opening comment. Okay. Thank you. Uh, members, we have about an hour and a half or slightly more maybe for questions. So what I would suggest is that we maybe take a round of questions first on the coronavirus situation, and then we move into a second round of questions <coughs> in relation to wider issues. Members content? Okay, Minister, thank you for your presentation. Um, there has been references recently to legislation that may be developed in order to respond to the current situation, and the committee would be very keen that we will work to expedite any, any uh, as, as the situation develops. But um, can you outline for us what, what types of steps are being considered or what may be looking at being looked at at the present day? Well, I, I suppose, Chair, the legislation has been there is legislation de being developed on a UK wide basis. Um, we have then put it into that as the Department of Health, so as the Department of Education. Um, I think that the Health Secretary asked uh, the opposition spokesperson and, and Labour to come forward and meet them yesterday so they could start to get into some of the details. Um, there will be measures um, that will be brought that will enable us to move from containment to delay to mitigation factors at this point of time. The drafting of those specifics are still being worked on, um, but I think the important point is that they have been done on a, a UK-wide level with executive support. Um, the committee will be given full sight once we see the drafted final copies of what is there, because it is important that we make sure the people of Northern Ireland understand the, the measures that are being brought forward and suggested. I do not want to get into the specifics at this <coughs> moment in time, because, Chair, to be quite honest with you, they are not public uh, across the UK or, or outside, um, outside the group that is, is working on them, because at this level of time we want to make sure they are fit. They're robust and they actually meet the needs of what we need to do when we move into the next steps. But what I will say to the members, as soon as they do become public, I'll make sure you get a full briefing on the implications 
as to what they mean just for, for the Health Committee and also for the Assembly at a wider level. Yeah. And the Committee, we, while we are conscious that there may be time pressures, we would, we would expect that the maximum scrutiny will be, will be applied, and we will expedite that process in, in terms of it takes additional meetings or whatever, we will do that. But, um, no, 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 and Chair, Chair, I do appreciate that, because I appreciate you know, the interaction I've had with yourself uh, and the Vice Chair as well, and, and any steps we've taken up until now, um, because I think it is important for, for us, from a department's point of view, for me as Minister, that we, we do this together, because the only way that we can we can channel, challenge coronavirus in Northern Ireland is actually by a collective work, and that's, that's not just from us at a political level here in the Assembly, that's how we address this at a societal level as well. Yeah. And I think myself and, myself and the Deputy Chair would welcome that, but the committee, the committee, the, wider, the broader committee, certainly will be keen to, to, work, to maximise that, that, that scrutiny. Um, in terms of workforce, the, the frontline workforce are going to, by all expectations, come under serious pressure here. What steps are being taken to facilitate the return or the re-entry of people who have potentially left the workforce in terms of removing barriers around registration, around costs that might be associated with that? Can you give us some outline of that, please? The finer detail of that is actually part of the legislation as well, but I think in the generality, maybe Michael, do you want to... Yes, um, I mean the legislation. And one of the issues, and again, this was raised by the deputy chair at the last meeting, in terms of our flexibility around returning to the registers, the various professional registers, retired staff, because clearly, uh, while retired, there again many of the very recently retired have significant uh, experience, which can be uh, deployed in terms of supporting uh, our response. So again. There are provisions uh, within the, the, the draft bill uh, to facilitate that. Uh, as UK Chief Medical Officer, we've been working very closely, for instance, with the General Medical Council uh, to facilitate and enable that. So that's the, the body that registers doctors. Or, um, and also to consider um, with other professions, regulars, the Health Professionals Council, for instance, which regulates other health uh, care workers. Uh, I know that the, um, we have communicated as Chief Medical Officers with, with all uh, with all doctors, I know the chief nursing officers are, are simply doing the same, um, and also that might include, for instance, we have a number of qualified health professionals who are currently not on the register, uh, but have passed finals and completed their exams, etc. And it may well be that that is a, a resource that we feel is appropriate to utilise as to minimise the pressure on on frontline staff. Okay. Um, there are a number of sectors, I suppose, who are expressing concern at the present time in relation to what the plans are as it relates to them. It was raised last at, at, with, with the chief social worker as well in relation to the nursing home and the, care, and the residential care sector. Um, there also are concerns from um, undertakers as to what, the, what the, the guidance is for them. So, Are there plans in place to address the concerns and of, of those sectors in the time ahead? There, there is, look, and I think this week, um, well, well, up until now, the, the, the planning that has been done by the department, I, I think, Chair, is second to none. The level of detail has been there, but it's when, when we utilise that and, and bring it forward to, to public consumption, I, I think, has been, as, as, the, as, the, as the call that we've been making is when to, when to go to the next steps. Uh, the Chief Medical Officer has a range of, of meetings and briefing sessions arranged with those different sectors over this week and the coming weeks as well to make sure that all the different sectors have the information that they need for their particular guidance as well. And again, look, part of the, the proposed change in legislation will affect as to how we approach burials and, and cremations as well, because that's not just something that will affect us here in Northern Ireland, it'll something that will affect us across, across the entirety. Of these islands, so that 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 what that work is ongoing. You know, I I've heard the call. You know, and what I would say to people: keep looking to PHA's website because one of the things that we're doing it's updated regularly. It's updated as soon as there is a change of any any bit of guidance. So rather than somebody relying on the printed out piece of paper that they have sitting on their desk that they printed off last Tuesday, keep them back to the website, keep them back to see if there's been any change of guidance for their, their sector specifically or in the, uh, for the generality of the population in Northern Ireland. And that brings me on, I suppose, to my next point in relation to there have been concerns raised in recent days around access of people who ha aren't registered with the GP, that they are getting the proper signposting and direction. Is the communication with GPs um, up, to, up to scratch in terms of dealing with the fast-moving pace of the situation? 
Michael, do you want to? Yeah, I, I mean, at the end, and thank you, Chair. You raised a matter in relation to uh, foreign national, for instance, who perhaps uh, was having difficulty getting uh, richer with the GP. There is pr GPs. There are provisions uh, for individuals to have public health treatment and advice, whether they're registered uh, with a general practitioner, whether they're a foreign national or not. Um, and uh, what we have done on the basis of an issue which was raised with us is reaffirmed that uh, information and recommunicated that uh, to, to general practice from our colleagues in the Health and Social Care Board. So GPs have a, you know, there's been a series of, of communications. I might go through the, uh, through the committee with a list from, from the 24th of January, 31st of January, 7th of February, 28th of February, um, again, out to general practitioners and our board colleagues have a specific dedicated web page uh, for GPs containing all the GP specific information, as I say, an FAQ, which now includes the issue around individuals who may be foreign nationals who may not be registered with the GP. Because again, uh, when dealing with public health issues, whether one's registered with the GP or not, uh, there is a requirement to uh, be able to provide appropriate uh, public health uh, care in the interests of that individual and the wider population. And finally, from me then, before I go to members, in relation to, and, and we are all very acutely aware that we are very heavily exposed to agency and to uh, locum doctors and agency staff, in relation to those areas, firstly, are there, are there guarantees in place that out of contract agencies will not be in a position to profit here in any way from this crisis in terms of, of, of what they are charging? But also, are arrangements in place for sick leave for locum and agency staff that will support them to remain in the workforce or to to go off and, and, and self isolate if that's necessary? Richard, you and I think, in, in terms of the off contract chair, I, I think this brings into sharp focus an issue we've been wrestling with for some time, mm -hmm. that, and we've made the point. The reality is. When you want to run a health and social care facility, you need a safe level of staffing to do so, or you, or you cannot open the doors. The reality is, at times, the system is virtually being held hostage by um, some off-contract agencies, uh, knowing that we need staff at short notice. Um, you, I mean, you're absolutely right that there, there is an opportunity for profiteering in this. Um, we, we would hope that common sense and some sense of civic responsibility would be brought to bear on that. It's something we'll keep an eye on. It's certainly, before this broke up, it's an issue that the Minister had signalled that he wanted to particularly focus on, was our reduction on our reliance in the agency and locum staff. He's, he's tasked uh, colleagues with looking at that. that. That work continues, obviously. It's had to, to take a backward step in terms of priority, but we're, we're acutely aware of it. In terms of the, the sick pay issue for those staff, First pass, that's an issue because they, they are employed by those agencies. It's an issue for those. It's something certainly we're alive to and we'll keep under constant review. Okay. Uh, I'll just move down to that. I mean, I think, just to echo the Minister's comments, um, in, as we move into some very challenging times ahead, I am absolutely confident that we can count on the professionalism of all our healthcare workers across every profession and their commitment and dedication, which we see day and daily. I think we're going to see that to the fore. Uh, in the in the weeks uh, and, and months ahead, it's our responsibility uh, to ensure we support them in that, um, and we we will continue to do that and get appropriate advice uh, and guidance to them, and we will do that and continue to update that as and when necessary. I suppose, Chair, not the, I suppose to finish out the the triumphant here, uh, and I suppose you know that's why we're working again with our union colleagues as well to make sure they're well briefed because we, we've done a considerable piece of work with them um, over over the past eight weeks, which I think should show them that we value the commitment their workforce actually gives to the National Health Service and the role that they play as well. So, how we tackle um, contract staff or, or, or and our agency staff, you know, is all a greater piece of work that we're working on with our with our union colleagues as well. But as I said, I, I think as I said in my opening comments, our day-to-day -day work that we were doing, some of us had to be scaled back a little bit in, in different areas while we concentrate on what's facing the health service at this moment in time in coronavirus. Okay. Thank you. I'll go to members now, and I'll be starting with uh, Deputy Chair Pam Cameron. Then just for the indicate for members Alex, Jerry, Paula, Orlea, Gemma, Alan, and then Sinead. So, Deputy Chair. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister. Um, Michael and Richard for being here today. It's really important that we, we get this um, information at this time. Um, given that uh, the risk posed by coronavirus is greater among the older population and those with underlying medical conditions, 
and it's obviously vital that the advice and support provided to those sections of the community is effective and proportionate. Um, it's crucial that nobody is left behind or falls between the cracks. Um, and in, in this context, um, Minister, can you provide assurances uh, that the welfare of vulnerable adults, in, uh, for example, in a nursing home setting, is at the heart of contingency planning? And um, can you outline what advice has been provided to those working on the front line in such settings if COVID-19 is detected? And uh, my second one on uh, the coronavirus is. Um, in terms of the safe staffing levels, and you've alluded to that there, and the, the risks posed by uh, the coronavirus obviously have embodied and reignited the debate around safe staffing levels and the need to ensure medical staff have access to not just supplies but equipment and personal skills and expertise as well. Given this, can you confirm what steps uh, you've taken to assess the current staffing complement? In relevant frontline services, as well as in nursing homes, to ensure temporary absences for self-isolation uh, doesn't impact on delivery or contingency measures. And as your your first um, point, Vice Chair, I think, uh, comes to the very crux of the National Health Service, where we support everyone equally, because that's I think one of the advantages that we do have that our National Health Service is free at the point of delivery, at the point of use. You know, and that's something that other countries do not have the reassurance or the support of. So when it comes to supporting elder, the elderly and those with underlying health needs, you know, they are at, they're at the heart of our health service, the bit at the heart of our reaction, our support of what we do, because that's what the National Health Service, that's what the National Health Service does best. In regards to ensuring that we have staff with the appropriate skills, and, and I think you, we will see when, it's, when I've said and I've been very clear, we will see a scaling back of some services. What that scaling back is actually to allow us to do at this minute in time is when we get ready for the, moving into the next phase, is actually to allow certain members of staff on this to increase their skill set so that when we do see a surge in patients who, who need additional so or more intensive support, that we have increased that skill set before we need it, so that we're preparing for the demand. And that, that that's what our surge planning is critically about. It's so we're getting ready for the next phase. When it comes, um, Michael, is there anything you want yeah, to? Yeah, just about the just the only guidance piece. Uh, the you're absolutely right. We are crucially dependent. We are partners with the independent sector, particularly as it relates to a provision of of uh, nursing care, residential uh, home care, care, and certainly also in in domiciliary care. I mean, those are hugely important areas, and particularly as we know that uh, some of our older people, particularly those older people with underlying aligned health conditions, are going to be uh, significantly at risk. In terms of the development of the production and issuing of advice, we did issue advice, uh, as the Minister said, it's on the, and has been on the uh, Public Health Agency website from the 27th of February in relation to uh, the, that sector. Um, again, uh, we, it is important that I again reiterate the, the importance of ch checking authoritative sources of online advice, and that includes the Public Health Agency, NI Direct, and our links to Public Health England advice. We are developing this guidance and advice at a UK level using the best experts available to us. Um, as I said, uh, as Minister has indicated, I will be having a series of engagement events uh, today uh, with the independent uh, sector, residential uh, care home sector, and tomorrow with faith-based faith groups and uh, NICFA, for instance, and again with professional bodies and colleges throughout next week and a range of other um, organisations. Because I think that in, in addition to um, producing guidance, I think there are some conversations face-to-face uh, -face that individuals will feel the, the value of, and I'm, I'm committed uh, to doing that. In terms of also the guidance, it's important that we issue that guidance at the appropriate phase and stage. We remain in, in Northern Ireland because of the success to date of our response in that containment phase. We are, however, moving into the delay phase. It is likely, as the Minister said, that we will see community uh, transmission uh, in um, the next uh, coming weeks. And therefore, we do need to ensure that we uh, minimise the impact right across the health and social care sector. So we will be uh, producing additional guidance around um, nursing homes and visiting, contingency plans for our domiciliary care, um, we will be considering issues about helplines for older people. We will, need, uh, we will have to think about and, uh, and put in place plans to enhance training 
for instance, for staff in the independent sector around infection prevention control. These are all things that uh, detailed planning is well underway in terms of what we're referring to as our surge planning, in terms of how we ready every part of health and social care for the pressures that we are, we are likely to anticipate. So it's not a question of not providing the guidance, it's about providing the right guidance at the right time and making sure it's as fully informed and accurate as we possibly can. But again, I will say that that advice will be continuously updated. And as Minister said, you know, it, it is such a rapidly evolving situation uh, that relying on our own traditional methods of writing a letter and saying, well, that was a letter uh, last Tuesday, the advice may change the next day. So that's the importance of us all fulfilling our professional responsibilities and ensuring we keep ourselves uh, up to date. Yeah, that's much appreciated. And just on the back of that guidance, <coughs> I welcome uh, that you're going to be, um, you're going to have a series of events yeah. and uh, to disseminate information, and that will include likes of uh, faith groups as well. Will that also include wider um, third sector um, groups? You know, I'm thinking people such as HNI or uh, specific charities that are dealing with, um, yeah. you know, health issues, which which will leave uh, certain individuals vulnerable, and even advice to. Um, you know, groups such as the, you know, Good Morning Antrim, for instance, you know, that that are maybe in daily contact with um, older people who might be a bit more isolated or don't have a lot of friends and family to visit them, or maybe because of this, people become more isolated. Obviously, if family members um, are self-isolating and not able then to uh, care for their loved ones, so will that information will that be spreading wider, or will you be directly trying to get that out there? And, and I suppose, you know, as, as the chief medical officer is meeting a number of those groups, I met with AGNI last week. It was on, on, on another issue, but we did have the discussion when we come to that point of engaging specifically with the, the older population. AGNI is up for doing and assisting uh, in any way they can, because that is one thing we are seeing coming from our voluntary community sector, coming from the third sector is how can we help? Yeah. Because I think there is a realisation across across society in general, you know, if if we work together in this, we can have a great you know, we can have a larger effect on how we tackle it. And support those who may be worried about being socially isolated at this minute in time. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is isolate people from the the virus. We don't want to isolate people from society. Yeah. You know, and that's where I suppose to to use a phrase that I think David Cameron usually knows, it's, it's the bigger society. You know, Northern Ireland, we still have that caring, supportive population, should it be for neighbours, loved ones, family members. When it comes to a time like this, I think this is when the strength of Northern Ireland society will really show itself and really come out to, to support the people that need it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I think actually that also raises the point of informal cures organisations being engaged with as well, given the reliance that we have on, on informal cures across the system. Um, Alex. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation. And I have to say you're doing a good job at getting information out and handling everything. So well done to you all. Thank you very much. Um, a few wee questions. Um, in terms of the budget, has there been any indication out of that thirty billion how much you might get here in Northern Ireland to help you? That's the first one. Um, can you confirm if there's definitely not been any community transfer of the coronavirus as yet in Northern Ireland? Um, in terms of nursing home and residential homes and the private ones, are those businesses or those homes or those residential homes expected to look on the public health agency website and so forth for advice or is there direct contact coming from the department or the public health agency to ensure that everybody's following uh, any actions that need to be done um in my own constituency there's a gp practice has closed um for a deep clean are you aware of that and it's that advice being given to them to do that um, also, in scaling back of services, has that already begun? Because I'm aware of people getting letters, cancelling operations and stuff. So can you confirm that stage is already happening? Um, the last wee bit is um, the issue about agency staff. Um, and <coughs> and the, the words I think you mentioned were sometimes we're held to ransom. I, th I think that as an issue needs to be looked at in the longer term and not just now because 
it's it's causing a problem in attracting staff because it suits some people to maybe do the agency instead of coming back in full time and it's a really big problem and it's costing us an absolute fortune. Yeah. Thank you. Finished. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I did it quickly. <laughs> No, sorry, I've sat in the same chair. Don't worry. Um, I suppose, in regards to, to your first person, uh, your first point, Alex, in regard to getting the information out there, I, I, I would be thankful, and I would want to thank uh, assembly colleagues and also also our media, uh, because I find the media in Northern Ireland being very responsive, supportive and getting the message out to the general public that we need to do at this minute in time. And that's why we've been doing that through regular briefings from the Chief Medical Officer and myself. And, you know, we've been doing the rounds of the TV studios and radio shows to make sure that we're getting the message out that we need to. Because folks, we're still in containment phase because the people of Northern Ireland are hearing the message we're given and they're reacting to it. So it's important that we keep putting that out there. You know, I've said this before, you know, the washing your hands for 20 seconds, the coughing into your elbow, catch it, you know, kill it, bin it, kill it. You know, those may sound very contrite statements to be made, but there's something that makes a difference to possibly one of your loved ones and how this virus may be spread. So there's the simple actions that we can all take will have a difference in how, how we tackle this. Uh, in regards to the, to the coronavirus budget, I think the, the Chancellor made it clear yesterday that this was a UK budget to tackle coronavirus COVID-19. So there's been no uh, specific pod said that this is your bit. We've been told you know this is this, that you'll get what what the, what we need to tackle this virus. Um, that's why I had to cut our presentation. I was meant to be doing three hours here, but we're back to two. There's a COBRA meeting this afternoon, which I hope goes into the more detail as to how that funding will be, be utilised or, or better used. Um, I'm trying to think of everything you were asking now. In, regar in regards to scaling back in the letters, um, I think I covered that earlier on. Um, in regards to how we prepare our current health service and the estate, and our staff to prepare for the next the next steps that we have to take in an increase in patients that need it hospitalised. So we're not cutting back um, surgeries or elective elective operations just you know, just willy nilly as strategic and how we cohort or prepare <coughs> specific wards, specific areas, train up cohorts of staff um, so they can provide the additional support on on training that we actually need. The agency work, come back I think to what Richard said, you know, your, your point is well made and it's something we've seen and it's something that again working with with our union colleagues, you know, I want to support our National Health Service workers as much as possible without having to rely on third agencies. Unfortunately this minute in time we still need them to deliver the service we do. So why we do that piece of transforma transformation um, work it will take time. Where we are now in regards to coronavirus has set us back and how we wanted to do that and the speed we wanted to do that, but it is a, it's a general piece of work um, we wanted to do. Um, GP practice. GP practice. And, and yeah, you mentioned the, the two things you mentioned are there were the community transmission. Uh, we, ha you know, thanks to, to the hard work and dedication of our public health agency, our GPs, and our hospital trust, we have not as yet seen evidence of community transmission in Northern Ireland. That is not the case uh, in the rest, in other parts of the UK, or indeed in the Republic of Ireland. The absence of evidence does not necessarily mean that there is not, um, and it would be, uh, I think, given the, the travel um, and the closeness <coughs> that we are to other parts of the UK and the Republic of Ireland, as I said earlier, and Minister said, it is only a matter of time before we do see community transmission, and that's why we need to think not only about the steps that we take as we move into the, the, the next phase. In terms of um, you know, GP uh, practice closures, obviously both colleagues within the board and the PHA will work very closely to support practices. If indeed, for whatever reason, uh, there is a need uh, to uh, close a practice, to deep clean that practice, that will be on the advice of the public health agency. There's particular guidance uh, as well on how that cleaning will be conducted and carried out. Uh, and indeed, then the health and social care board team, their primary care team, will look at how individual patients in that practice area will be supported, perhaps from, from neighbouring practices. So, as I say, those those are um, events which will occur, and we will see those, and we will certainly see those increasingly, or we have seen those increasingly in the containment phase. Um, 
and may see that less so as we move into uh, further phases where we have some evidence of wider uh, community transmission. So we're working really hard at the moment uh, in the containment phase and we will continue to uh, take those steps uh, around containment and trying to control the spread of the virus even as we move into the delay phase. Okay, thank you. Okay. Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for the presentation, Minister. I mean, obviously, you know, it's a global pandemic um, at the minute, and by definition, it affects everybody, but vulnerable people, um, the sick, elderly, the most has been referenced. Um, first question, Minister. Um, people are telling me that there's not enough hand sanitizers in hospitals and public buildings, so I just want to ask, is there a plan to intervene here? Um, I think, generally speaking, uh, the example has been early intervention works. I mean, Italy delayed uh, its response, and that's one of the reasons why it spread so quickly. By comparison, Taiwan, which is very, very close to China, acted very quickly, and the cases are below 50. So I think early intervention is key in, in Taiwan as well. In response to the SARS crisis, they set up a National Health uh, Command Center, which basically expanded research provision to ensure that this was COVID-19 and other respiratory uh, uh, diseases were um, researched and prepared for. So I think that's something we need to look at here as well. There's concern as well, I think it was on the radio this morning, um, about people aren't being uh, tested as quickly uh, as is needed. I think South Korea, they're, they're regarded as doing that uh, very uh, quickly and rapidly, so that's that's a concern um, I think people have uh, around the issue. I think just generally speaking, I think we need to ensure that public health is being put before uh, private profit. You know, you see the likes of Cheltenham being organised at, uh, at the helm of large bookmakers and companies. I think you have to ask, uh, is the market uh, and the interests of the wealthy being put before the, the health of the vast majority of people? So I think that's a point that has to be made in relation to the coronavirus. And just finally, um, I'm concerned about the lack of ICU beds. Uh, the EU average is 11.5 per 100,000 um, of the population. My understanding is Italy has 12.5, so slightly higher than the EU average, but they're obviously struggling to cope uh, with the, the virus for all sorts of reasons. My understanding is we have 5.3 beds, ICU beds per, per 100,000 of the population. So I'd just like to ask you, do you think we have enough beds? And if we don't, are there any plans to uh, acquire uh, private ICU beds to bring them in uh, to ensure they're used <coughs> for, for, for public provision? Okay. Um, thanks, Jerry. Um, in regards to the hand sanitizer, yes, we have enough stock. Keeping it is our problem. I think, as I said in the the chamber on Monday, part of the problem we're now seeing, and I told people that I think it was maybe the question that you had asked, we're now seeing hand sanitizer being stole out of hospitals and GP practices. GP practices actually reporting that as a patient walks out of the GP practice, they left the hand sanitizer on the way past and take it home. Now that doesn't help them. It doesn't. You know, the next patient that comes in through the door then has nothing to utilise. So you know, f from this meeting, chair, I would like to put that message out very clearly. If you're thinking you're going to, you're helping your loved ones or you're helping someone who's in that GP practice, or you're visiting somebody in hospital by stealing the hand sanitizer out of the hospital, you're helping no one. So you know that somewhere we have the stocks, but it's keeping that continual supply up there. So just ask people to respect the, the service that. The National Health Service does by providing that use in the, in the places where it are, where it actually is, and, and increasing that to across the rest of the, I suppose the Northern Ireland Civil Service. That you know, will they certainly with other departments as they're, as they're how, how they're doing that. <coughs> in regards to how we respond in, in a timeline, um, a move from um, containment to delay. I've been very much taking decisions and approach to the UK level that has been science-based and science-led, and I think to date that has proven us well where we are at this moment in time in regards to, as Michael was saying, we haven't seen community transmission. What we're doing has worked. You know, any, any case that we have, we're able to trace back to the point of contact, where contact tracing has worked as well. So it's about using the tools that we have in our box to contact COVID, to, to actually fight COVID-19 at the right time. You can use them too early where they actually lessen the effect that they could have if they were used at the right point in time. And it's all about that talk, you know, about how you actually flatten the curve so the NHS actually is able to make the peak rather than get over over consumed um, by the peak. Um, in regards to um, um, ICU beds and, and the number that we currently have, Michael will be able to give an update on detail, but one of the <coughs> things um, I, I, I do want to make clear 
you know, not everybody who tests positive for who contracts um, <coughs> COVID-19 goes to that, that stage as, as the final point. You know, people can have the coronavirus COVID-19 and actually present as completely healthy. They may test positive, and that's why we recommend self-isolation to make sure they're not spreading it to, to families or loved ones. So when it comes to the number of ICU beds, yes, we have a limited supply in Northern Ireland. Not everybody will need there. We may need at some point to incre increase the number of beds that are supported by ventilation systems, and we do that by you know by stepping down. And it goes back to stepping down some of the provision that we do. So we'll not be using our operating theatre, so we'll not be needing the, the associated recovery room that's sitting beside, which have, has ventilation points. So it's not the utilisation of ICU beds that will be critical, it's, it's the, the availability of ventilation for some pa patients that will be the, the critical point in need, but I'll let the doctor pick up on that in a minute in time. Um, in regards to testing time, now, I, I was asked that this morning actually on Good Morning Ulster in regards to the 36 hours. Michael's looking into that because it's not something that, <coughs> that we recognise. We have um, we have one of the 12 accredited labs here in Northern Ireland for, for testing for COVID-19. Um, one of one of those across the United Kingdom. Uh, the makeup of the virus was only known in, in January, so actually, well, by by the scientific world moving so quick, so that we could actually test it as quick an advancement. So we're moving to ramp up our testing uh, capability. You know that, that involves moving to an automated system, to, uh, so we can test more samples at uh, at once and that sort of thing. But and. You know, that, that work is ongoing while, while we up ramp. So hopefully the, the testing time number, we don't recognise it at this moment in time. I'm not saying it's not right, but it's something we're, look, we're looking into. Um, in regards to your, your point on the National Health Service and looking to companies you know, using... Yeah, well, people, com, people com, are, are not responding to yeah. the, the demand for a public health uh, response to this, and some people are... Trying to see it as a way to, you know, maximise profit and, yeah. and wealth, and I think that's uh, look, it's, it's wrong. It's, it's morally wrong to be. Never mind what way. Though, but I think you, your point was, you know, Cheltenham and big business running, you know, running events rather for money. That, that our, our focus is our national health service, of, you know, and, that, and that's that's where we're at at the minute. Those decisions are, are without without us at, the, at this moment in time. But it, you know, it's something people have to take into their own cognizance. You know, what's more. What's more in your own mind? You said that you want to see a horse race or making sure your family's going to keep safe. You know, so there's a personal responsibility. Responsibility is there as well. Michael, is there anything there at yeah. the ICU? Yeah, just to say that in terms of the ICU, um, we have plans in the research plan to expand our capacity to ventilate patients. We, we had plans, if you remember, back in 2009, 2010, <coughs> to do the same in relation to H1N1. Um, you know, that will include, as the Minister has indicated, uh, using ventilators as we downturn uh, other activity uh, that can be redeployed. It will it may involve, for instance, non-invasive, uh, so that's people not anaesthetised and, vent uh, and, and ventilated, but actually uh, non-invasive ventilation with mask. Uh, and again, uh, up-training and upskilling staff to be able to provide that uh, outside of uh, high dependency units. Uh, uh, and uh, outside of out, out of ICU. So again, these are all parts of of the, the planning and preparation. I mean, just on your point about command and control. I mean, we have been in command and control and have those operation centres up since you know for the past eight weeks, and that's that's been that has been the day job. It's been the day job for myself and departmental colleagues and um, uh, uh, Richard and the de departmental team supporting uh, Minister. Uh, Minister has been in. Uh, our, our, our operations room and indeed similarly that uh, our command control operations room has been up and running for the same period of time uh, within our uh, public health agency with uh, health and social care board colleagues and extensive planning has been going on uh, within our health and social care trust as you would expect and the public would, public would expect over a significant number of weeks. I mean, now is the time to refine those plans and if, as we begin to move into uh, the next phases of our response to ensure that the appropriate information is is placed yeah. into Check given to health point professionals point. and to other sectors uh, so that they can equally also uh, be prepared. Um, just in terms of your, your point yeah. uh, around um, sort of the mass gatherings, there, there is, there, you know, it's, it's a tricky one, isn't it? This um, every, there is a public perception that these that you know, intervening in such events is a good, could must be a good thing to do. The science suggests that there are other things which are more beneficial 
um, uh, than that. Uh, it's not to say that there isn't potentially some marginal uh, benefit, but again, uh, the more important things that will make uh, a significant contribution in containing uh, spread, delaying spread, and as you say, assist the public health response. Um, and if you think about it, uh, if you're in an enclosed space um, with close to lots of people, the, the risk is greater than being in an outdoor space, perhaps with two people to your left, two people to your right, two people in front of you and two people behind you. Uh, and if you're moving around in an open air environment, we know that the risk uh, of, of a high risk contact is significantly less. So I think that, you know, in all of this, as Minister has said, um, you know, we'll be guided by the science and considering the appropriate steps and the right combination, as Minister has said, the right combination of those steps to take at the right time. Um, and if you take those steps too soon, um, then what happens is you have all the adverse downsides of those in terms of economic cost, social cost. And if you take them too late, something that you also alluded to, then you don't get the benefits. So it's the right combination of interventions at the right time to get the maximum impact. Well, oh, Jerry, just in your in your point and, and Michael's point in regards to command and control, we have that within the Department yeah. of Health. But last stretch, and maybe just there's a wider level goes after that to an executive yeah. level as well, which I think would be useful for the committee to, to know. And it, it's just to acknowledge the point the Minister has made, that whilst at, at a fundamental level this is a health issue, the response to it needs to be societal yeah, rather than just yeah. within the health service. So it's just to acknowledge the work of uh, colleagues in the executive office. They have, yeah. They're having uh, weekly meetings of what's called C3, just command, control and coordinate, and that's looking across the whole public sector landscape. Yeah. They had a planning exercise last week. But that's important to bring in all departments mm. together because even in terms of managing yeah. the health risk, as with any health issue, lots of really good work takes place out with health and social care system. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Paula. Thank you, and thank you, Minister, for coming along this morning. Um, just to pick up on the last point there that Dr McBride mentioned <coughs> there, um, I have seen the advice that the Public Health Agency is providing to the universities um, about St Patrick's Day and the potential for mass gathering in the Holy Land area of South Belfast. Um, you will know that um, there is a mixture of house parties. They go from one house party to the other. They go into the street. They're in engaging in alcohol abuse. They're engaging in illegal drug use and the potential for community transmission is, is fast considering they're coming from all over Northern Ireland and the ability for secondary tracing is minimal or will be uh, uh, very, sorry not minimal will be massive. Um, Section 16 of the Public Health Act talks about prohibiting children um, from cases of entertainment or assembly to prevent the spread of infectious diseases. Is there any way that that piece of legislation could be looked at as a one-off for that day? Because I have written to the Chief Constable and asked him for additional resources, spoken to the university, so as you say, it's a public health issue, but I just think in this one instance it has the ability to be a, a massive impact. Uh, sorry. sorry, and then I've just got a couple of very quick questions. Um, the uh, Leo Fragger is in the next hour is going to make an announcement of closures of schools and hospitals. What contingency is there that if, if um, healthcare workers are off looking after their children, then that there's a backfill? And then two other very quick questions. First of all, around the um, informational public health agency's website, a, con a message from an expectant father during the week there, concerned about his wife. Brilliant information on Royal College of Midwifery's website. Is there any way that that information could be linked across? Um, and also, then the last thing is, what would happen if a GP gives the wrong advice to uh, a patient, a family? Come on in, and I'll test you. You know, is that a referral to the GMC? Or what? What would happen in that case where they're actually ignoring public health agency advice? Okay. Thank you very much, Paula. Uh, and I suppose, look, in, in regards to your your, your first point. Um, about the university house parties and all the rest of it, I suppose that's the the unintended consequences of Belfast City Council cancelling the St Patrick's Day parade. You know, every every decision has a number of adverse reactions, and I suppose that's what we're actually seeing now. And I think that was that was always part of my concern. You know, if we if we started to cancel public gatherings before the science was telling us there was clinical benefit to it, and it's also if you move too quickly in counselling public gatherings or closing certain facilities that people become weary and don't actually respect it when you actually need to do it. So I, I think your point in, in regards to the universities and, and how students react um, 
is well made, and we can get the public health agency maybe just to have a, have a sit down with the universities, maybe even students' unions as well, just to, to reinforce that message coming from from that side. You know, think about what you're doing, but you know, obviously, sometimes in St Patrick's Day, students don't think about what they're doing, and that's where we end up. You know, and the difficulties that the that we do have around certain areas of, of Belfast. Uh, in regards to the legislation, I, I'm not aware how quickly that could be enacted by next Tuesday. I don't think it I, I, I don't think I don't believe it would be a proportionate response. The powers res- within it? Yes. Yeah. I, I don't believe it would be a proportionate response at this time. Okay. Okay. Uh, certainly on, on, on the basis of a public health intervention. I don't think it would be a, a proportionate public health intervention at this stage. Yeah. Um, in, in regards to um, the announcement that the Taoiseach is making, I, I haven't seen full like contingency planning for health contingency pl- Look, we, we have a global meeting this afternoon. You know, we will. We, I would say probably that it will be it will be raised as to what next steps will look like, and then the call will be made when those next steps are utilised. So, I suppose we'll take that into the round in regard. But what I will say, and we'll, we'll put on record. We have very good interactions with our, our colleagues and counterparts in the Republic of Ireland. Um, a number of contacts now with Minister of Health Simon Harris. The Chief Medical Officer has a good working relationship with Tony Hillahan. Our Permanent Secretary has regular phone calls with with, with his part with his equivalent in the Republic of Ireland as well. Our health, our public health agency, and the Republic HSE <coughs> um, have a good working relationship and do share a lot of, of best practice, all the rest of it. So if there's anything that we need to do in support of them or vice versa, especially even when it came to contact tracing at the start of maybe people coming through Dublin Airport travelling to Northern Ireland, you know, we were able to work hand in hand when our advice was slightly different than the Republic of Ireland. Um, they were actually putting our notices up in Dublin Airport, you know, if you are now travelling to Northern Ireland, this is what you need to be aware of. <coughs> so we've had that working relationship in the past eight weeks, and it's a strong relationship that that we can utilise. Uh, the cross sharing of, of information, if there's information out there from the midwif- midwives that the PHA can pick up on, certainly, you know, we're, we we want to make sure that everybody is getting the best most recent, most up-to-date advice that, that applies to them. So, uh, In regards to GPs and the GMC, uh, there will be one for the Chief Medical Officer. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, obviously, as I've said in answer to an earlier question, it's all our professional uh, responsibilities as registrants, whether we're doctors, nurses, social workers, allied health professionals, physio- whatever, whatever we might be, to ensure that we ensure that our practice is fully informed by the latest available um, information and guidance. The challenge in this, and the challenge that I think we've heard uh, in some of the comments that have been made publicly, is just the volume of this guidance over a very concentrated period of time, and the, the regularity with, with which we have, for good reason, <coughs> had to change and update that. So it is challenging, and I recognise that for organisations, for providers, whether in the statutory sector, independent sector, or, and all working in it to keep fully abreast and aware of that. So in relation to your specific uh, question it would depend on the circumstances is the answer as to whether this was a, a, you know a circumstance where an individual was not aware of a change in guidance or an individual acted out with that guidance as to what would be the appropriate action but what I would say is I know our GP colleagues have been working extremely hard hard we heard dr Lauren Storman uh, interviewed uh, uh, representing the RCGP uh, last night there has been a significant volume of calls on our, our GP. Uh, GPs have been taking and, and advice that they've been providing uh, to people making contact who are concerned that they have, have symptoms. And increasingly over the next uh, weeks and months, all aspects of health and social care in the system will come under increasing pressure. Um, and it's important that we continue to ensure that we get the right advice uh, to the entire system at the right time and at the right stage. Um, and as Minister has said, uh, clearly, that the, that those information that information may change uh, as we move into into next week. Okay, thank uh, you. And I think, in, in regards to the GP and the information, I think that's why it was beneficial to us to get access to NHS 111 for that yeah. initial triage and all of, of people's concerns and symptoms. You know, it was a big step, and it it took a lot of work from officials very very quickly to get us in, into that. I suppose the front front end of <coughs> NHS 111, which <coughs> I think has been has been beneficial. He has how we alleviate some of the pressure off our GPs as well. Thanks to NHS 111. And thanks to NHS 111 for allowing us to. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. And I'm conscious just of time as present on, so I'll just ask members to keep questions reasonably succinct, please. And I'm coming to Orlea. Okay, thank you, and um, thanks for the briefing, Minister. Um, and obviously, I appreciate all the hard work that's being done um, by the department and all our health and social care staff. Um, but you have mentioned in your briefing um, outside of um, red flag cancer cases. Um, is there any other services or important areas of work that the department um, are trying to protect alongside your planning and preparations and dealing with the coronavirus? Um, and I'll just use the example at the, the all-party group meeting um, the other day on suicide prevention. The PHA had mentioned that obviously because of the pressures and the strain that's being put on, on the department, it might have an impact, a knock-on impact then on the implementation group for the um, Protect Life 2. Um, strategy, so it, it's really just to put it out there. I don't know if it is a possibility that the department could even look at putting in an interim chair just so that process can continue on at some level. Why? Because I'm, I'm conscious, Michael, that yourself as CMO, you know that your time will be taken up in, in dealing with, with the virus. So that was just the, the first um, comment to make. And then the Minister had also um, touched on the stepping up of the capacity for. Um, the testing process. Um, you have mentioned a, an automated system. So my question was in and around: Do you plan to increase the amount of the testing pods? Um, and I know whenever some of it was covered this morning, um, when you were speaking on um, Radio Ulster, um, it was also mentioned around when someone here locally is tested positive with the coronavirus, there's then a second process of validation where the results are are sent on to. Um, England. So, um, the, I just wanted to ask quickly around how long that process of of um, sending the, the test results over to England to then be confirmed. How long does that process take, and has any consideration been given um, if it was more um, efficient or if it was qu quicker to do that process on the island? Excuse my naivety on the subject. If it works, then brilliant, all well and good. I just wanted to ask that question. And just to finish off, I think it was important the points that, that Jerry made. Um, in and around the, uh, the the ICU beds, and you know where, wherever we need to source them from, whether it's private or public, um, I just think it's really really important that the message that we're sending out to everybody at home um, is that we're guaranteeing that that anyone, regardless of your economic status, uh, will um, have access um, to emergency care if that is what is required. Thank you. No, um, or than in regards to I think your your first point, you know, the work the core work that we do in regards to mental health doesn't stop at one stop. You know, the the mental health action plan sh should be I think we're prepared to, to launch it within at least the next week and a half anyway. So so that work has been going on. Your your point about Michael Chair and Protect Life to mm -hmm. certainly is something that if if we need to look at centrally we will do because that work Cannot stop. It uh, shouldn't stop. You know, I'll make you that. Can make you that guarantee here, here today. In regards to the the, the the testing pods, we are making sure there's one of those in at least each trust area, if not each hospital. So that has been increased. But we have to be aware then as well that we have the staff to man them as well to do that as well. So uh, one thing I would like to, if I can, use use this form as well. People should only go to those testing pods if they've been referred mm -hmm. by a GP to go to those testing pods. We have people turning up just to see if they might have coronavirus. You know, so when somebody's in that queue waiting to do that, they're delaying somebody who actually has been referred by a GP. So I'm asking again, you know, people, please, in the provision and the services that are there, act responsible um, in utilising them. In regards to the utilisation of ICU uh, or private facilities, all the rest of it, whatever we have to do to tackle this, we will do, because as I said in the beginning. Um, the NHS is there to make sure that our health service is free at the point of use, free at the point of delivery. So it shouldn't make any difference where we are in an economic, or where your, your <coughs> economics are, your finances are. That's what the National Health Service is here is to support every individual <coughs> in Ireland at the same point. Just on the the, the point around the validation process so and the the, the testing, the, the, the validation. I'll, I'll, Michael can do the timeline, but why um, once we get the positive test result here in Belfast? 
we declare that a presumptive positive, so everyone is treated as if they are positive yeah. at that point. The sample that goes to England, England is simply as a second val validation. So you know, we, we don't wait on the result coming back to England to tell anybody. It's the Belfast result is the one gotcha. that people are informed of. But the, the timeline, I don't think so. Yeah, right. no, and, I, and maybe that's maybe what was referred to in this morning's news report. I don't, I don't really know the details, but again, it's you know basically because this is you know as the minister said, very rapidly develop, developed technology to carry out this test in an illness that was you know first noticed on the 10th of December, uh, and the genome, the genetic makeup of this virus, then shared you know early early this year, and then in February mm -hmm. we were testing here as one of 12 centres across the UK for this virus. Um, and as I say, the, as we get more experience and we get automated, the turnaround time for the tests will increase. We also need to think into the next phases as to how we use that testing, because if indeed we have wide, uh, wider community transmission, then the focus of the testing uh, may need to be redirected to those perhaps who are hospitalised and receiving hospital care. Um, so again, you know, it's, the, these, you know, what we're doing at this phase and stage may not be what we're doing in the in the next phase and stage, and it's something again that we need to be very mindful of. Obviously, we, we'll, the minister, will uh, clearly articulate that and communicate that. Um, but again, the situation that we're in, the containment, what we'll be doing many of these things into the next phases. Um, as I say, some things and how we do them uh, may change, and certainly, again, back to the advice, the advice and guidance will change as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, I am now going to Gemma. Thank you. Thanks very much for coming in today. I just have two quick questions on the practicalities. Um, so, if someone has been referred to a testing pod, is transport provided? Because obviously, if we're trying to contain it, I know they've only been referred; they haven't actually been tested positive. But if we're trying to contain it, obviously, the mode of transport they get there is very important. And the second question is. Um, how do you plan to protect our homeless population? Okay. In regards to the, to the, the, the first point, my understanding, uh, they go in your own car, you make your own, your own way there. There is no transport laid on to go to a testing pod unless it's, I suppose, necessary. Unless it's, unless it's necessary. Yeah. Yeah. And then the ambulance service comes in and is used at that mm -hmm. point. But yeah. what we're conscious if you can use your own. If you can't use your own safe facilities, do please so. do, okay. uh, because it's safe to do so, because we can't afford to be tying up our ambulance yeah. service. It's there to support people who can't get, but we don't want to be... So if someone does need it, they can... They can get Oh, yes, okay. I, oh, no, yeah, but we, won't, we don't okay. believe in okay. uh, In regards to, to supporting the homeless, it, it's something I think that was raised... Um, it was raised in the assembly, and it's work that is ongoing, yeah. because it's, you know, it's, it's a cohort of people that are, are hard to... Our to interact with, even at the medical point of view, we, we have a, a nursing team specifically in Belfast that work yeah. work with the homeless. So you know they have been provided with the information. We, we did, when as you know, uh, one of the things which we did under transformation was to establish the um, uh, the homeless uh, hub, um, which um, specific funding for that, which we've been able to maintain that service with also plans to enhance services in, in, in Derry, London Derry as well for uh, for, for the homeless. That provides primary care access, access to dentist, dental care, um, etc., etc., podiatry, uh, mental health uh, input and support, and also an opportunity then to provide advice. Clearly, back to Richard's earlier point, that's the sort of situation where obviously we, we obviously work very closely with the Department for Communities um, mm -hmm. as part of that cross-government planning and preparation to ensuring that we protect all of our citizens, uh, you know, whether homed or homeless. Um, so uh, y y those are particularly vulnerable group, as Minister has said, we're particularly mindful of those needs. And again, we will be working very closely. And I know our, our Chief Nursing Officer has been in communication also with uh, the, the community voluntary sector, the Simon community, etc. Et okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And Alan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, uh, Dr McBride, uh, Mr Pengelly, I think I've been speaking for everyone uh, in placing on record the public appreciation for the work that you all and your team have done to date. Um, can I ask the Minister just for his assessment uh, of the public buy-in uh, to the containment advice that has been given by the Public Health Authority to date? Uh, certainly on the ground, my impression is that it has been quite positive. Um, Alec referred earlier to um, a surgery that uh, a doctor's surgery that needed to be closed for uh, deep cleaning. But have there been any examples of that actually uh, has happened? And if it does happen, 
Um, does the GP and the surgery staff have to self-isolate then for 14 days? Do we, do we lose them uh, in, this, uh, in this battle against this uh, spread of this disease? I know that uh, Imperial College uh, in London, I, I understand, are a world leader in data modelling of the spread of infectious diseases and I've no doubt that uh, you have access to that uh, information coming from there and I'm sure that, that will help you shape your contingency planning. Uh, can you reassure the public, uh, and I appreciate you can't share a lot of, uh, and it's not a lack of transparency, but you can't share a lot of your forward planning, but has your uh, forward planning as far as possible, have you eliminated uh, the prospect of, of too many nasty surprises coming along? And in relation to the actual testing, does there, does there become a point in this? I know that the next stage is the delay stage and then we go into mitigation. Um, is there a point where testing ceases to be done, that, uh, that uh, the, the concentration is on treatment of, of, of patients with an assumption uh, that they do have the disease and that uh, resources that would be currently tied up in testing will, will, be, will be deflected to, to actual care of patients? Okay, um, thanks, Alan. In regards to, to the information that's getting out there, in regards to containment and the steps that we need to take, it is working. And the reassurance that we have in that is that of all the positive cases we have in Northern Ireland, none of them are con by community transfer. We can't go back to that point source of, of infection, which gives us a reassurance. People are hearing what we're saying, what the public health agency is saying, what the Health and Social Care Board is saying as well. So. To, to us, that information is getting through to, to the majority of people in Northern Ireland. So I'm content it's working. When we move into additional steps or further steps, that information will ramp up accordingly as to what additional steps individuals and people people need to take. In, in regards to the information and the modelling that's coming, coming back, I suppose it's one of the things that, again, um, being part of the COBRA call, the medical COBRA call with other health ministers across the United Kingdom, supported by chief medical officers across the United Kingdom, we get advice and guidance then from SAGE, which is the Scientific Advisory Group on Emergencies, which are those people who are at the top of the field. You know, they're not politicians, they're not all, they're not departmental employees either, they are they are recognised experts in every field, so when they're coming forward with scientific advice, it's non-biased, it's non-political, it's non... There, there's no self-interest in what they're doing because... The public interest. Academic, it's for public use, it's academic use, and, and some of them don't even want their names published as being who they are on it, so that, you know, they're, they're not getting any glory out of being there. So, so the information and advice and guidance that they gave is is sound and it's something that we uh, have been following before. In regards to testing, um, we will continue testing while we are in containment phase and move into the delay phase as well because we need to know where where the virus is and how, how it's utilising. When we move into further, if we ever get to mitigation, you know, at that point we have to look at the usefulness of testing in the wider general public, but that's, but that's farther down the line. That's, I suppose, working where we are at this minute in time. Um, you also regard, you know, and, and you, you were talking about next steps and how we go, you know, surge planning really and where we are. Um, I sat in on our, well, it's, it's the transformation implementation. implementation group. It was meant to be there, but how we transform different parts of the National Health Service. We reconfigured that slightly to bring in, you know, sort of the directors from across the trust the chief executive, or the director from across the department, sorry, the chief executives of all our trusts, um, Northern Ireland Ambulance Service, Northern Ireland Fire and Brigade, you know, Northern Ireland Fire Brigade and Rescue Service as well. So we're sitting at that point doing that strategic planning at that level. So we're getting information from across all the parts of the health family, because, you know, we have to remember it's not just our hospitals, our GPs, you know, social and domestic, or domestic care, social workers, Ambulance Service, Fire Brigade, everybody is a part of the, the wider response there as well. In regards to the GP surgery, I think it was the point, Michael, do you want to... Yes, uh, um, I mean, in? obviously, every case is individually risk assessed, so I, I can't give a sort of blanket answer to that. So what would happen in those circumstances is that the uh, practice concerned in, in conjunction with the public health agency experts would assess what the particular 
incident that occurred, what the uh, risk was to individual um, those, for instance, for instance, who had attended the practice, uh, or indeed uh, individuals working in the practice, irrespective of what role. And the advice then would be tailored to whatever the, the degree of risk was assessed at. Um, the, you know, obviously, the risk is, is, is relates ma mainly to close, you know, personal, you know, or close contact. You know, sitting as I'm sitting beside the minister uh, for more than 15 minutes, uh, you know, within a, a distance of two metres um, over over time, or indeed cl very close household contacts, by passing one of you in the in the foyer. Um, uh, you know, it does not put me at significant res risk, unless the minister has, has said, unless you, know, you or I are not following the good respiratory hygiene in terms of, you know, catch it, kill it, bin it. So, you know, cough, you know, cough into the crook of our elbow, use tissues uh, when sneezing, dispose of those tissues and wash our hands, and wash our hands regularly, and wash our hands before we touch our eyes, our nose, or our mouth. Those are really, really important things which we can't emphasise often enough because, as Minister said, they are making a difference, and they will continue to make a, a, a difference, and even make a difference when we see uh, community transmission because it will help us suppress that peak and push that a little bit further, relieving pressures on our health service. And as I say, we don't yet know whether there's some seasonality with this virus. So we may see as we get into late spring and um, into into the early summer uh, that the virus is less transmissible because of most respiratory uh, bugs are and let viruses are less able to transmit uh, during uh, spring and summer. Okay, thank, you. thank you. And finally, Sinead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, firstly, I'd like to go back on Jerry's point about hand sanitizers. Um, I appreciate the department may have its stock, but I'm conscious of across all departments, public sector, sector workers, uh, for example, road service workers, people who write in society, if, they, mm -hmm. if there is a check across departments that they all have access to either easy access to wash their hands or, if not, uh, access to hand sanitizers. Um, first question really is then going on to about testing. I'd like to understand better the the testing and um, just to understand if there are no financial barriers, how much is it per kit to test? Do we have enough tests, kits in stock for the projected peaks? And have we scoped out resources in terms of there's any re, uh, human resource or employee barriers? to carrying out the tests in laboratories, so for example, leaning into our universities, where there may be a skill set there who could come into play. And um, basically I'm looking at the example because whilst I appreciate and you know accept that we're leaning on best practice and good quality scientific data, there's also live data coming from the likes of Korea, where they appear to have had success, which they benchmark against having intensive early testing and I would hope that our data coming through is cognizant of that. Secondly then, um, looking at the, the vulnerable groups in society and I appreciate that um, sometimes we ask questions and we say things like we are not there yet but there will be many, many good people, Minister as you rightly pointed out across Nor Northern Ireland who want to help in any way they can. But with all the best intentions of some good Samaritans, they may be doing the wrong thing. So I think there would be, um, this is a window of opportunity to prepare and plan and put information out to local groups, be it local GA clubs, church groups, people who maybe want to get organised in their communities to reach out to the vulnerable people who may go into isolation early because they recognise themselves. And to my mind, when I look at this suppress the peak, you're looking at the pressure that exists against the health service. Now, from my perspective, I imagine that pressure will come not wholly, but in large part from that vulnerable group of people who will need hospitalisation. So there is good sense in speaking to those people earlier. Because if they feel safer to go into isolation, they need to know they've exchanged telephone numbers with people in their community where simple things can happen, like a phone call to check they're OK, they have their medication, bread and milk's being delivered, just good neighbourly practice, but being carried out well. And certainly as the uh, chairperson of the APG and Loneliness, I would offer my support in doing anything we can 
in getting that clear, good quality messaging out early to communities so that they can engage and everybody play their part helpfully. Um, I would also ask for some clarity around the different stages because I remain unclear when we move from one stage to the next um, what the social implications of of that are. And I know certainly probably all members have had queries from people working within the health service, chemists, dentists, schools, GPs, carers, even people from the food supply chain or shops who sell food, wanting to know at what stage of development would it have implications for them so they can also prepare. And, and I think we're, it's about being measured and timely and not creating panic, but allowing people to have the foresight to say at what, at what point they come into play. Um, I'm conscious of time. Yes, I'm really conscious. But I'm also conscious that, uh, Chair, in the South, it looks like the acting uh, Taoiseach will move to the closure of schools and public services today. And if that's the case, it may have happened. Yeah, I think it has. It's gone so, from Friday. So I think. Um, so if that's from Friday, there is a disparity across the island on where we are, and I'm thinking of border regions. Um, if there are implications for any sort of social disruption, you may see a flurry of unintended consequences in areas where we're at. And I really think it's time for us to work in unison. And finally, Chair, I, I just will um, throw in one. I was concerned to hear that some misadvice had been given out over the 111 system uh, regarding people returning from Italy. And I don't know if there was any scoping carried out to find out if anybody from Northern Ireland was involved in that. And just I would be reassured to hear a final word that we are prepared in terms of volume across resources and services, be it ICU beds down to maybe nebulisers to people who can be treated at home and access to oxygen. Thank you. I've got nine questions here, Sinead. <laughs> <Yeah, Shanae. laughs> and I could um, give you nine more, Mel. <laughs> look, and, sorry, not to be facetious there. Chair, I think this is a good engagement on regards to what is a very current serious problem at this moment in time. So I, I'd rather not maybe rush this section. Um, maybe if it would be helpful for you, I'm conscious of time here. Rather than moving out of coronavirus, COVID-19, and going into a more generic round on where the department is, where my priorities are in other areas, would it be helpful if we rescheduled that second phase sometime soon? Well, I'm conscious that, as you're telling us, that time is going to, everything's going to be Aye. kind of subsumed almost in dealing with this over the next period of time. Um, to what, what time can you... What time do you need away from here today? Well, I, I, well, I do need because to be there are, there I are do, questions on wider issues that I, think I, I we do need, need to, I do need to be, well. yes, but I need to be leaving here at 12 because we have a Cobra um, shortly after 1 o'clock that I need to get ready for. So I, I'm conscious, you know, we're having a good discussion on what is a very topical, serious issue in regards if there's quick topics we need to cover in the second section. Happy to do that. But okay. I think we'll ra- rather than rushing okay. the second session, Chair, what I'm saying is I'll make myself available to come back to the committee at a later stage to have a wider engagement on the more the more general issues that okay, the members can count that we do, that we take that approach and we continue to 12 on the on the coronavirus okay. 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 well look if there is, if there is other issues you want to bring in very quickly on well if that, time allows what we time allows Chair, I, i'm more than happy because by the time answer she needs nine questions we can mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, sorry, but, not. but we will we will minister expect they to come back because there are other pressing issues oh, i'm offering myself to come back chair um, starting off, Sinead, in regards to testing kits, it's, um, it's not a specific physical kit, it's medical equipment that's used to take swabs, that's transferred to a lab that's used, so we're not buying specific things to test people, if you understand, it's not a specific piece of equipment, it's genetic, generic medical equipment that's used to take samples, and so we're not curtailed by that, it's the process that we have, and that's why we're moving, I think, to the next stage, to the more automation of the lab process as well, because as as we find out how, as, my, as the chief medical officer was saying, you know, <coughs> the identification of the virus itself, how we test for it, how we look for it, you know, we've been able to automate that process, and that's been something that's been done very quickly, you know, and it's, I think been done by support from UK government into research and testing as well. So, um, <coughs> the vulnerable group, 
groups uh, and again on how we engage them as quick as possible. Again, the chief medical officer is, as he indicated earlier on, mm -hmm. you know, we're meeting with NICFA, we're meeting with the church, faith-based groups, um, supporting our people's commissioner, age and I, etc., etc. Yeah. You know, so, so, so all that work is there, but it's providing them with yeah. the best advice and the most up-to-date advice. Because I think your concern was that people isolate too early. I don't want people to feel they have to isolate too early. Because as I think, as, as we were saying, you know, what, uh, I want people to isolate themselves from the virus, not from society. Because you know, as chair of the the, the old party group on loneliness, you know, that's one of the worst, I think, effects we could put on someone at this moment in time that they do feel that they have to isolate themselves, that they move away from society and they move away from families quicker than they need to. So, if the organisations and the contacts you have through that old old party group might be worthwhile if you can yeah. share them. With us, because you know, let, let's use the offices that you have, or, mm -hmm. or maybe your all-party group. If we could reach out to it, it yeah. might not, it might not be Michael. We might get someone else, PHA, even to come and talk, yeah. talk to that all-party group, because I think that 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 engagement is, is useful. Um, one one of the things you you did hit on in regards it was how those people who self isolate get their bread and milk. One of the things, and it's not the question you asked, but it's an answer I'm going to give you. One of the things that has concerned me. Is the panic buy them that we're seeing? Yeah. You know, and you see that coming from uh, the shopkeeper yeah. nodding, nodding his head beside you. There's, there's no rationale for it. What I think we believe has created the panic buying is panic buying. You know, so yeah. when you listen to a, a very good advocate from this is Aidan Conley from the Retailers Consortium in Northern Ireland. You know, he puts that message across. You know, they're there to do, they're there to do that piece of work that keeps the shelves stuck, the same way the Department of Health is here to support people. And, and their needs, uh, and their medical needs in regards to how we, we create, uh, tackle coronavirus. But I think the message that I want to get out as well as, as, as number one, other ones that again, you know, the panic buying. There is no need at this minute in time. You know, it's it, it's irrational. You know, and what it's also doing is putting older people, more vulnerable groups, as well as in a situation who can only afford to do that weekly shop, when they're going to the shop to look to those essentials that keep them going, they're not there because somebody's hoarding them. Doesn't make sense. There's no medical need. There's no societal need to see what we're doing at this minute in time. So again, to, to use the opportunity, chair of this committee meeting, I would just reinforce that message that's coming from the Northern Ireland Re Retailers Consortium. You know, there's no need for doing what you're doing at this this minute in time. Um, in regards to the triggers as to how we move from from step to step, it's not a calendar. You know, it's not three weeks out from the initial case mm -hmm. we go to there. It's when we see, especially in Northern Ireland, when we start to see community transfer, where we see the number of cases um, increasing to a point that we do need to say, look, this is now at a point we move to containment rather than, or we move, move to delay rather than containment. You know, so it's not, you know, we've decided next Tuesday we're doing this. It's the indicators, it's the science leads us. This will be the right time to do it. It's not. We're doing it tomorrow. We're doing it midnight tonight. There will be a lead-in time when we move from one, when we move from containment to delay. But what I do want to make clear as well that the, the things we're, that we're doing in containment just doesn't stop. You know, it's not a clear-cut line between the two. You still do. You still continue to do certain containment practices, even though you're in delay, because it makes good sense and makes good medical sense to do that. So there is no specific dates. It will be a trigger of a number of scientific factors that moves us from one stage to the next, and that's how we've reacted to this. That's how the executive has reacted to this, as by through that that scientific um, that scientific advice. Um, because you know, I think it was your own words. You know, lead on time. You know, it has to be done in a timely manner. It also has to be done in, in a managed manner as well, so that we don't panic people into mm -hmm. taking reactions that we don't need to take. So it's about that. It's about being alert but not alarmed. Mm -hmm. I think is the best message that we can get out of of moving from that that delay to the next. Um, so I'm trying to get through here. Well, um, this despite the surge planning again, going back to to where we are after how we prepare an ICU beds. You know, I think going back to, to Alex's point earlier on in regards to people receiving letters, you know, you're not getting this procedure. Now that is the initial outworkings of surge planning. That is how we start to prepare certain areas and certain hospitals, certain members of staff that need upskilled in certain areas so they can support that need as it comes through when we need it as a, as a medical professional. So that's 
that's how that system is already starting to kick in, and it's the small steps that mean when we do need it, it's already there, it's already planned for. So that's that's the work that's been on for the past eight weeks is how we get each one of those steps right in sequence, because you know it's it's not about the big bang when we need to do it, or there's a large spike, we're suddenly left looking round, how do we cope with this? It's about making sure we have the steps. And again, it goes back to that, how do we involve society, which is, which is, which is your point, and it's a valid point, because we do need society to help us tackle this. We also need the executive, we also need every department working alongside us. Should it be the Department of Communities to make sure that we're supporting the homeless? Should it be the Department of Communities and how we get that message out in regards to the change in welfare payments? Department of Agriculture and how we support no the Department of Agriculture and Rural Affairs in regards to how we support vulnerable people in the rural society as well, because though you know infrastructure, how we interact at ports, airports, economy, how we look to our flights, how we look. Um, to supporting people in employment that's not in employment, justice, how we support our people in prisons, how we keep the court service going, how we work with our police if it's a necessary downturn. What other department have I not given a responsibility to yet? Executive office. The executive, the executive okay. office is the, is the coordination. Mm -hmm. It's the bit that takes you know, overall control to make sure that the, the departments are looking outward as to how, what their response is and, and supporting <coughs> health as to how, how we tackle this. You know, how, how we tackle this issue that's going to be with us for a number of months. And I think that's one of the messages as well, that when we get through this, we still have a responsible piece of work to do as the Health Department, as the Executive of Northern Ireland, and picking up where we left off to make sure we get society into the, into the place that it is. So there is a wider responsibility out there, and it's, you know, again, I don't want to repeat it, but, you know, wash your hands, catch it, bin it, kill it, you know, those simple steps aren't just there as, there as mantras for us to make people think they're doing something. It's about getting people to do something that actually supports and protects their loved ones, the vulnerable one, the vulnerable people in their homes, the vulnerable people in their society, or in their friendship groups. You know, yeah. If you're stopping the, the spread of the virus, you're helping them as much as you're helping yourself. I think I've covered most of your points. Uh, Is there yeah, just that misalignment with North South and the one 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 query. Uh, sorry, look, the alignment of North South, and I think you know, when we've been sitting and having having the conversation, there has been a realisation at certain points in time we will not be running in parallel in the advice that they're given. Usually, the science leads us to the point that at some point we are we are concurrent. That happened with travel advice in the past, but I want to be clear as well. Um, we're not in the same place as the Republic of Ireland is at this minute in time. So we don't have community transfer because of the steps we've put in. And, you know, and that's where we have to be cautious. We have to be take, take the steps that are responsible to us. It does cause us, I suppose, challenges because of the interaction um, at the border, and we have the common travel area as well. So that's something that we're cognizant of. That's why we work at the level we do with our counterparts in the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom to make sure that there's there's an approach that works north, south and east, west, because our aim as the Department of Health for Northern Ireland is to make sure we look after the people in Northern Ireland. In regards to 111 and variances and, and advice and guidance, without a specific case, without I can't comment, we, we did bring in 111 um, at very short notice under a lot of, I suppose, intense working to make sure that here in Northern Ireland we had that opportunity and the professional advice that 111 gives in the initial steps as to what to do on coronavirus. Now, we don't have access to the GP service, which is the end of 111. So when you get the initial coronavirus advice, you're still referred back to your own GP here in Northern Ireland because it's a different, it is a different health system. We have access to the NHS 111 for the initial steps. Yeah, um, just on that, I, mean, I think it's just fair to say that um, Probably a victim again of the changing travel advice from the mm. uh, from the Foreign Commonwealth Office, which obviously is the UK <coughs> department. When that changes very rapidly, which it did due to uh, changing events and decisions made by the authorities in Italy, they have to rapidly uh, update their advice, considering a range of factors. And then there's a need to rapidly update um, the narrative and the script for 
uh, the call handlers in um, uh, Manichet 111. So, you know, th th those are some of the challenges. And again, it's just the speed and the <coughs> at which uh, things uh, are changing. I think I'll just come back to, to Jerry's point earlier when he, he indicated the WHO's declaration of a global pandemic. You know, this virus is, you know, being transmitted in many, many countries around the world. It becomes increasingly less relevant around geographical areas because it is being transmitted and there's evidence of community uh, transmission in many countries in Europe. So the idea of where you travel to or where you travel from becomes increasingly less relevant. What it is... Excuse me, Michael. We've just had an urgent call that you, uh, yourself and the Minister are required back at the castle there now. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I apologise for putting that session short. Right. I think they are, I think, something I think, we've done. Think, <laughs> um, so listen, thank you. I want to wish you all. I want to reiterate the advice that you gave us in terms of people doing the things that they're asked to do, in terms of people not stealing necessary equipment from, from yeah. health care facilities. I think that's very important. Yeah. And... Uh, we, we, we can return to, to these issues again. Thank you. Right, okay. And Chair, look, we'll come back. Uh, you. You know, let's work to get the dates so we can come back and cover the other general health issues. But again, I want to thank you and I want to thank the committee members and, and the supportive work um, you're giving uh, me, my officials, and everyone who works in the health service at this moment in time. You know, those, those words of encouragement and help mean a lot to the people working in our health service. So I just want to place on my record, thanks for keeping that, that positive message up. So thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Good work. Members, I'm going to propose we take a quick comfort break there and then come back to the rest of our meeting. So could we be back here for 5 to 12? Hand wash. Members, thank you. We return now, as we agreed earlier, to return to item 3, the draft minutes for the meeting. Um, can I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 5th of March, which are pages 6 to 11 of the meeting pack? Are members content with those minutes? Mm -hmm. Content, thank you. Matters arising then. Um, members will remember the committee considered the second progress report on the autism strategy at last week's meeting and agreed that the clerk prepare a draft letter to the department seeking information. Uh, the letter is in your pack there, but are members, uh, are members happy to... Agree the letter is drafted? Yep. Yes. Okay, thank you. Moving on then to um, SL1, the Food Information Amendment Regulations 2020. I affirm members. Yes, sir. Sorry, have we missed? Oh, yes, yes, sorry. <coughs> if we, I overlooked there, there's a new agenda item today for a, a briefing from the British Dental Association. So I advise members that representatives of the British Dental Association are here to brief the committee on current issues in oral and, he and health and dentistry. Can I refer members to documents from the BDA at pages 118 to 124 of your table of papers? And I'd like to welcome to our meeting this afternoon Ms Caroline Lappin, Chair of BDA NI Council, Mr Richard Graham, Chair of NI Dental Practice Committee, and Mr. Tristan Kelso, Director, BDA. And can I thank you for agreeing to brief us at such, at such short notice on this, on this very important issue. And I now invite you to go ahead with your briefing. Thank you very much. Uh, the British Dental Association is the voice of dentists and dental students in the UK. As a trade union and a professional body, we represent all fields of dentistry. And in Northern Ireland, our work is largely structured around the work of our three committees. The Northern Ireland Dental Practice Committee, which represents independent general dental practitioners. The Northern Ireland Salary Dentist Committee, that represents dentists employed in the community dental services. And the Northern Ireland Council, which considers the overarching issues and the importance of dentistry in Northern Ireland, such as workforce. So firstly, thank you very much to the committee for the opportunity to present to you today. We are very encouraged to see the institutions back up and running, and we hope that our evidence will be informative to you, the committee, as it establishes its forward work programme. Um, we will trust that you will forgive us if it's a little bit rough around the edges. It's not every day you get asked at the opportunity to step into the minister's slot at such short notice. So members will be aware that we wrote to the committee on the 16th of January to set out in broad terms some of the key health challenges impacting dentists and oral health provision at this time. Those issues highlighted included oral health strategy in Northern Ireland, remuneration, community dental services, morale and motivation within the dental profession. 
and we intend to speak on those today and also on financial mitigation measures for general dental practitioners in response to the coronavirus issue. It's everywhere. <laughs> in terms of the oral health strategy, at the outset, improving the population's oral health is at the very heart of us in the BDA and our mission. As healthcare professionals, dentists are fully committed to delivering the best possible care for our patients, often in less than ideal circumstances. It may come to a shock, as a shock to some of you, that in 2017-18, 4,724 children in Northern Ireland underwent the trauma of having 23,035 teeth extracted under general anaesthetic. Over 20,500 of these teeth were deciduous or baby teeth, and that rate is three times higher than the pro rata in Northern England. By age 15, just under a fifth or 19% of children here can be considered to have good oral health. And according to the most recent child dental survey figures, 21% of five-year-olds eligible for free school meals here have severe or extensive tooth decay, compared to 11% of other children of the same age. And that oral health inequalities gap widens further by age 15, when the figure is 12% versus 26%. So when you consider that poor oral health can have considerable impact on a child's physical health, but also on their well-being, confidence, mental health development, the incentive to tackle this wholly preventable disease should be great. However, the existing oral health strategy for Northern Ireland dates back to 2007. We see a need for an updated strategy to put in place a fresh vision for oral health one that is wholeheartedly focused on de delivering better outcomes for our population and which recognises that oral health is directly linked with our overall health and wellbeing. In October, uh, BDA, we held our Oral Health Matters Summit in this very building and we were delighted that the Chief Dental Officer then announced the setting up of two oral health options groups that would take forward policy options for children and the elderly. However, five months more have passed and these groups have yet to meet. Indeed, we are unsure even when these groups will, groups will meet. In November last year, we also welcomed the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee's Health Funding in Northern Ireland, Ireland Health Report, which devoted an entire chapter to oral health, and we aren't accustomed to receiving that level of attention in dentistry. That committee report concluded that the Department of Health in Northern Ireland should develop a new oral health strategy for Northern Ireland in collaboration with the dental profession to be published in draft by early 2021. To date, the department has been reluctant to accept the case for a new strategy, and we would urge this committee to add its support to its key recommendation. With regards to remuneration, as independent contractors, general dental practitioners in Northern Ireland have experienced significant real-term reduction to what they get paid to provide health service dentistry over the past decade estimated in the region of a 30% pay cut for practice owners and 39% for associates. This is as a combination of public sector pay caps of 1%, while the costs associated with delivering health service dentistry have gone up at a considerably higher rate, which is no different to health inflation anywhere. At the same time, the removal of commitment payments to general dental practitioners, previously worth in excess of £3 million per annum, has added to this cumulative impact. Put simply, in the view of our General Dental Practice Committee, current health service dental fees are simply not sustainable. When you compound the situation with uplifts being applied late in recent years, very late, you can start to see that this impact is having a huge effect on small businesses in managing their cash flow. In terms of mitigation measures for coronavirus, the Committee will be aware of the letter we recently sent to the Health Minister calling for the introduction of financial mitigation measures aimed at underpinning the sustainability of health service committed general dental practices. As the majority of health service remuneration is comprised of fee per item, any significant disrupt disruption caused by the impact of coronavirus could have devastating consequences at a time when practices are already struggling to be viable. This issue has been recognised by the Scottish Government and the Scottish Chief Dental Officer, who is proactively working on a programme of mitigation of measures for NHS practices there. To date, we aren't aware of any such mitigation measures for general dental practices in Northern Ireland, which is why we took the step of writing to the Minister and copying in this committee. It is in everyone's interests to make health service dentistry sustainable for the future. 
including in an issue as potentially serious as coronavirus. In terms of our community dental service, while our community dental service comprises approximately only 7% of the workforce, it is the community dental service that is charged with caring for some of the most vulnerable cohorts in our society, not least the frail elderly population. It was noted in the HSC workforce strategy that 40% of community service dentists are due to retire by 2025. Last October, we received draft terms of reference for a CDS workforce review, which we accepted. Unfortunately, five months on, the CDS workforce review group has still not met. This work is vital as we seek to ensure the appropriate levels of skills are in place to meet the growing demand for the service, not least from a growing population that's also retaining more of their teeth into not later life. On workforce issues, I could mention the significant shortage of dental nurses that is negatively impacting in general practice, a significant pay disparity issue for our hospital dental trainees, and that issue is being progressed through the BMA the lack of resource available within the department to progress in dental policy. In terms of morale and motivation, according to a recent study, only 14% of dental practitioners in Northern Ireland rated their morale as high or very high, the worst in the UK. Ultimately, what we hear is that practitioners do not feel sufficiently valued by the Department of Health. This is perhaps not surprising when, on the evidence, it appears that oral health has not been a top priority for this department over the recent years, and we hope that this can change. Finally, I want to dispel the myth that <coughs> oral health is somehow in competition with priority issues like cancer. The evidence is increasingly showing that good oral health can result in improved health outcomes for other important areas. We want to be seen as part of the solution in prioritising a shift towards prevention. In closing, we accept that considerable improvements have been made to oral health in recent years. However, we need to put in place a strategy that can map out how we can make further improvements going forward. Getting the children's and the elderly's oral health groups options groups up and running would be an important step. Getting on with the CDS workforce review, including oral health and overarching departmental policy, and putting in place steps to ensure we will continue to have NHS dentists into the future are key. Thank you for your time, and we're happy to take questions. Okay. Thank you very much for that presentation, and very interesting. I have to say that I, I would have had a general awareness of the impact of oral health on, on overall physical health in particular, but given that, I, I was shocked to find out recently that the, the greatest number of admissions of children to hospital are actually related to, to oral health. And given that being the case, then, what is your assessment of why the department are not prioritising, let alone not bringing forward a new strategy? Surely it's an imperative. Um, as you've rightly pointed out, the, the, the most common reason for a child to be admitted to hospital throughout the UK is for extractions under general anaesthetic. It seems that within the Department of Health, or oral health has slipped down the agenda, perhaps due to a lot, a lot, there are other issues, but the issue of, of children having to attend at a young age for general anaesthetic extractions has such an impact on their life moving forward, and this is a wholly preventable disease. We are aware that the headline figures can, can, can can, can show that there is a, an overall increase in good oral health in the population, but what that is hiding is the massive uh, uh, quality issue that lies underneath. Um, in, my, in my own job, I, I carry out these general anaesthetic extractions, and we, we are constantly seeing that good children with good oral health are, 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 are improving, but that cohort is getting worse. So those children who are living in areas of social deprivation, they are getting multiple teeth out. It, it, it is unusual for me to go to a theatre session and take three or four teeth out. Last week I took 14 teeth out on one child alone. You know, these areas of inequality are continuing. Uh, the the, the dent, de, dental, dentistry within the, the department, I, I, I don't think it's wrong to say, has a very small presence. And at the minute, because there's really only the chief dental officer in the department, there is no presence just at, at this moment in given time. So we are slipping down the radar. And within the BDA, we are doing our best to bring these issues onto the table and to the agenda in the absence of having that representation of more bodies within the department. And, and also, you have to remember that these are indicators for other areas and that these are the first 
children there are too much sugar in their diet they're going to have obesity they're going to end up in the type 2 diabetes epidemic so you know, th this is early pointers if you intervene at this stage you can help so many other areas okay. Pam were you looking to make a point on yeah, that? Yeah it was really just on your point Chair um, and I'm kind of thinking it, and you just meant, touched on it there the link to obesity and obviously this is a it must be massively an education mm -hmm. issue in particular um, but is there also um, uh, an effect on the, on the statistics because I don't know what stage it changed, but at some stage in the in the past, dentists used to be able to extract teeth yeah. locally in the surgeries with general anaesthetics. Yes. General yes. anaesthetics but were now moved. you've got to be admitted. Yeah. They were moved out of general practice. 2001. Yes, I was going to say like 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, I know how old but, my children are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's also, I mean, general practitioners can sometimes use relative analgesia of gas and, and inhalation sedation sometimes, but because of regulation, it's getting more and more difficult to do that. So more and more is ending up with the community service and the general anaesthetic. And the costs to general anaesthetic in, in secondary care are phenomenal. I mean, mm -hmm. if we spend a penny, you know, we'd save pounds down the, down the line in prevention. Thank you. Uh, an issue has been raised with me recently in relation to smaller sort of rural hinterland dentistry. Th there's been an issue raised with me around payments not being processed or a withholding of a percentage and, and that they feel that that's impacting their cash flow. But also it has been said to me that, that, they, that they feel, it feels like or they believe that there's a, they're almost being pushed down the road of going private. Would that be a concern that you share? Because certainly we would be very concerned if there are if there are motivators here being used to, to drive practices down the route of private because it's already difficult enough to access service. So what's your um, view on that? I, I can see them both looking to me <laughs> for this. Uh, having worked in the mission fields of West Tyrone all my practising career, uh, I think you're probably talking about the Practice Alliance here, where yeah. it's getting more... And The Practice Alliance was designed in a time where two men worked in in a practice, say a practice had two surgeries, and two men, they work full time, and the practice allowance is based on you having a certain number of patients per dentist, a certain number of paying patients per dentist, and a certain gross per dentist. It makes no allowance for part time working. So if you have, say, four young female dentists working in those two, two surgeries, and they're working part time, they won't be able to meet those commitments, those numbers. So the, the two practices could be identical, but because instead of two full-time workers, you have four part-time workers who are all counted in the figures as full-time, then you lose 7% of the gross income to your practice. And that can be a considerable amount of money. You're, you're talking into the tens of thousands of pounds. And that's the difference between a practice surviving and not surviving. Those practices will have only one choice, and that is to go down the independent or private route. If they continue in the health service route, then they will go out of business, and that will be no good to anybody. Yeah, and that, that's hugely concerning in itself. But I also think there's a quality impact there in that largely women are, are working part time, so this could be directly. And I would wonder, so I think, I think that's something that we will need to, to keep an eye on. And, and I, ask I would agree with you. I, I definitely uh, agree with you that more and more younger practitioners, not just women, but men, are working part time because they find the pressures of practice too much. Um, that's concerning to me as well, very concerning. Um, because it messes with your workforce issues as well. If every younger practitioner who comes out and they look at their practicing career, maybe stretching forward now 47 years instead of 40, and the guy, I can't do this full time, so they take one day off a week, your workforce issues are then out by 20%. Um, but I qualified in 1984, I went into practice, you just started, you work nine to half five, Monday to Friday, sometimes nine to eight on a Thursday, and nine to one on a Saturday, and you just worked. Younger practitioners just cannot work under the pressures with increased regulation and probity that there aren't. You just couldn't do that. Okay. Thank you. Um, going to members now, and I have Paula, Gemma, Pam, Jerry, Sinead, and Arlea in that order. Um, good morning, and thank you. Um, just, just 
quick um, straightforward questions. First of all, what is your position on the fluoridisation of water? Is that a policy you support? And the second <coughs> one is, um, I think Tristan, you were at the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health when they launched their State of Child Health report. Um, and when I looked it up, um, there wasn't any data. Um, I'll give it, maybe try and get you the specifics here. There wasn't any data in terms of the comparisons across the three parts, of, four parts of, of the UK. And I'm just wondering how you're fitting in really with their campaigning, because obviously, as you say, it seems like a very small issue around child dental health. But if you're linked in with bigger organisations, so it's really just about how you're sort of trying to collaborate to push this stuff forward. If I could take the second part of the question first. Um, we have been linking in with the RCPCH um, more closely in recent years. There is a little section in, in their latest report about oral health, and certainly they have uh, voiced their support in, in favour of a new oral health strategy. Um, I suppose there were figures around the GA extraction rates for the other three countries. Northern Ireland, I think, had been missed, which we were a bit disappointed about, but I think the reason behind it was the figures from Belfast Trust were missing, so they were deemed incomplete figures. Okay. But even with the incomplete figures, I think we were all agreed they're very damning. You know, um, sorry, the first part of the question then was water fluoridation. Yeah. I think really the BDA position would be um, where there is local demand for it, we would be supportive. Um, I think we're cognizant of debates in, in previous years and and all sorts of issues. You know. It's being done. The evidence base seems to be there, you know, to, to back it up. But I think we wouldn't be leading on that on that particular issue. But certainly, if there was strong support, consensus, we would be backing that and happy to to, to help where we could. I think the World Health Organization <coughs> said it's the most uh, cost-effective health measure that uh, anybody can do to help a population. Um, we. We've always been in favour of fluoridation, and we always will be. I've, I've always believed that the only way you get fluoride in the water supply is for dentists to come out against it on the grounds that it will put us out of business. Uh, governments come out against it on the fact that it's too expensive, and then we prove that it's an aphrodisiac. In, in terms of fluoride, Paula, um, it's a very good question because fluoride is the, the one evidence base in dentistry that nobody seems to argue with. Mm -hmm. uh, we know the effect of, of fluoride, fluoride toothpaste, you know, in, 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 in the scientific journals has proven to be so, so good. In, in terms of fluoride um, and use within Northern Ireland, uh, as part of the transformation monies, uh, there were two fluoride varnish projects that got on, on underway throughout Northern Ireland, looking at, at vulnerable groups in society. So the application of a very strong um, <coughs> concentrated fluoride varnish, which is a prescription-only medication, and that uh, application up to three or four times a year, depending on the risk factors for the patient mm -hmm. as to how likely they are, how likely they are to get decay. So those were two transformation-funded projects which were taken forward for children and taken forward for the elderly. Uh, the other good thing about these projects in terms of transformation was it was a way of making our workforce work differently because dentists, we're not going to argue, are the expensive part of the workforce. So as part of the transformation, it was upskilling dental nurses to be able to give them accredited course and qualification in order to apply this varnish. The projects were up and running through the community dental services in Northern Ireland and unfortunately the transformation money was lost at the end of year one and those projects disappeared overnight. And those were, they were transformative, they had the, the, the potential to make a real difference for vulnerable groups of patients and we lost them overnight. Sorry, Chair, just come back. I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that actually because that's the sort of longitudinal stuff that you yes. need. You need a yes. good number yeah. of years to see the yeah. impact. So I think it's something we could certainly, well, I'll certainly follow up yeah. on. Thank you. That, that is one of the problems <coughs> in that health is a generational thing. You, you don't get immediate results. You have to, you know, doing this for one year was a waste of money. I know. You, know, you need to do these for generations before you notice impacts and differences. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Gemma. Thank you. Thanks very much for coming in. Um, Pam touched on this earlier about it's been it's obviously an education issue in terms of the younger children's dental health. Um, what do you see as a way around that? Like, I know whenever I was in primary school, I remember it, I think it might have been a dental nurse coming out and showing us how to brush our teeth, mm -hmm. but obviously things are a wee bit tighter now and that can't happen. So what do you see as a way around that and as well, why is there a shortage of dental nurses now? Is it lack of facility or lack of training places or is it nobody wants to be a dental nurse or 
I'll is it the wages? Or? The okay. You could take the dental nurse and come back. <laughs> Our expert in dental nurse training. Um, so the first part, you're absolutely right. We, we, we had what was called the school nurse, okay. Okay, or the school dentist rather. And um, I'm old enough to remember the caravan rocking up at the school, <laughs> and we'll just leave it at that. Um, so th there are changes. There are changes in, in the way things have been done. So the, that would have been done through uh, is the community dental service. And we were very much known as the school dental service. Mm -hmm. But our resources have not increased. As I said previously, we're 7% of the workforce yeah. of dentistry in Northern Ireland and we are at the minute we are being left to deal with the tsunami of uh, our older population who are retaining teeth which is the good news story yeah. are retaining teeth into later life the, the way that dentistry is funded and paid for in Northern Ireland is through the, the, the fee per item service for general dental practitioner colleagues like, like Richard they are unable to run a business effectively and care for the rest of their patients by, by looking after like, medically complex older people with comorbidities who are difficult to treat, mm -hmm. take longer to treat and have a lot more issues. So they are automatically following the community health service. So a lot of those other programmes that we were involved in years ago fell away. Yeah. The only evidence-based oral health prevention programme that is funded in Northern Ireland is what's called Happy Smiles and that is targeted towards preschool children in Northern Ireland but again it's only targeted towards at the minute the funding's only there so that we are able to deliver it to the 20% worst wards in Northern Ireland. The plan through the early intervention transformation programmes, the EITPs that some of you will be aware of, was that the Happy Smiles project would be rolled out to reach every preschool child in Northern Ireland and we have been left out of that and that hasn't happened. Okay. Uh, the dental nursing part, you're, you're right, I mean, dental nurses do still come out to our practice, the preschool groups, we have trained one of our nurses in dental health education, so she's asked about every year and, and we just do that, it's part of a community effort that most yeah. dental practices would do if, if anybody asks, if we have the spare capacity we'll do it, yeah. we don't actually get any pay for doing it, so it's, uh, it is a community thing and, it, yeah. and we believe we're part of a community and we should do that. The problem with uh, dental nurses goes back to when dental nurses were first registered by the General Dental Council. Uh, I can't give you the date, but it's many moons ago. Um, they decided to grandmother all the people with, without a qualification onto the register. Okay. Um, and that group of dental nurses is coming through as a whole sort of cohort, okay. and they're going to fall off the other end. Okay. The problem is we're not training the dental nurses who can now only get onto the register with a registered qualification. Yeah. We're not training at this end. Um, we've actually recently found out, and uh, one of the problems with this was there, uh, there's an ISIL education board uh, for dental nursing uh, who run one of the um, training programmes, and we didn't realise that they hadn't, Tristan might have to correct me, they hadn't registered with the appropriate body their qualification in Northern Ireland. So then the Department of Skills and Education can't fund that. So nobody, nobody kind of knew this. The, 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 the training was being funded through the practices, and the practices find that's very difficult to do, because if you imagine you have a certain budget for dental nursing, and if you have uh, training as part of that budget, it is quite expensive to put somebody through the yeah. examination. Uh, at the far end, they'll come out and go, I'm, I'm qualified now, I, I want a little bit more money in my pay packet, and you kind of go, well, I've just spent all that money training you. The practice down the road who never trains dental nurses says, uh, we'll pay for you, <laughs> we'll give you a little bit more money. Okay. So you're only going to train uh, one person through that route and lose them, you're not going to do it two or three times. Mm -hmm. just just if I could quickly add, um, yeah, the NEBDN isn't accredited under the apprenticeship scheme. So we had recent meetings with um, the Department for Employment, um, Department for Economy, and they said I think at, at the, this minute there's only 14 sort of recognised dental nurses training under the apprenticeship scheme. So only the city and guilds is recognised. So there's an issue there, maybe about accreditation and, and seeing if we can rectify that. We're in very early, we've just learnt of the problem and a possible solution, so we're in very early days trying to sort it out, but it, it kind of is getting a bit more acute. Mm -hmm. Can I imagine? Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank you, Gemma. Pam. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Um, just kind of a, 
it strikes me that um, when I mentioned education earlier, um, and certainly my, my children are long, long, long grown up, but uh, I know that my, my eldest child, I refrained from giving him as, as a baby for the first year of his life anything other than milk or water to, to drink and avoided sweets. And to this day, he, he is the one with the least, fewest issues with teeth. That, that has got to be a vital piece of information that has got to go out there to expected mothers so that they know, just because the, the teeth haven't arrived yet, that there is a severe impact on what you put into your baby's body. And, you know, the outcomes are hugely significant. Yes. And obviously, when you have problems with your, your teeth, that has a desperate impact on your mental health as you as you grow up and become a teenager and an adult. Um, but um, what my, my question actually is, um, you know, what what is the reason for the department resisting a new strategy that's so badly needed? Is it is it just is it simply down to resource on the issues, or is it because we haven't been here looking at the issue for the last three years? Well, what what is the act, what do you believe is the actual issue that's yeah. preventing that strategy? I think the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee put it really well in their um, report, uh, the health spending in Northern Ireland report, that said. There's a lot of ad hoc initiatives yeah. and things that are going on that are good, but there isn't that overarching strategic approach towards dentistry, towards oral health. You know, back to the RCPCH, this one child approach, you know, dentistry has been disconnected and oral health has been almost not recognised as part of the wider prevention and general health and wellbeing, you know, all of those issues. In the response, all I can say is, I mean, we have, you know, is it, is it our position if, or is it our job, if you like, to, to, to lobby so hard on, on oral health issues? We have been doing it for the past number of years just to get the department to recognise there is a problem. And the response that we get is, well, because improvements are being made, we're on the right path. They've said that all the targets that were set in the 2007 strategy have been met and indeed exceeded. But you know, we, we, we know we can see the inequalities, we can see the GA extractions continue to persist. We've been told it's a resource problem um, and, and I think there's a there's a human resource issue within the department in terms of the real lack of uh, resource dedicated to dentistry and to oral health and to actually help drive these things forward. Um, wh whatever issue within dentistry that you look at comes up time and time again. You know, we can see where the CDS workforce reviews have been left right to the end. You know, at, at dentistry is sort of the, the poor relation, the sort of Cinderella there. And I think it's about trying to, you know, we're not in competition. Um, I think if you, if you tackle this one and, and make it part of the, the you, you get, you know, you get so many wins. You make benefits on oral health, you make benefits on the childhood obesity thing. They're common risk factors there. You know, let's find a common solution. So I think it's down to resource, but sadly, from previous experience, I know that the department gave the exact same reasons for years around a new cancer strategy, and that was put off for years, and it took a lot of the charities years and years campaigning, and eventually they yielded and they got a new cancer strategy. So, you know, the need is there. I think it's just acknowledgement, and let's see how do we put the outcomes in the population first. We've, we've, we've found through data from the Business Service Organisation that in the under fives, under four children uh, age group, there is 65,000 children who are not registered with a general dental practitioner in that early years. And, and as my colleagues have alluded to, there are some pockets of very good work in and around general dental practices who will, will, will provide, for no, for, for no fee or anything, go out to provide some preventive advice to a little group or a church group or any sort of community thing. We do that within community services. Um, but it's all, you know, you've heard the phrase pilotitis so many times, these little pockets of work, and we come back to the same issue all the time, when there's no overarching strategy, our vision to, for, for, the, for, for, for healthcare to, to follow, um, they, these pockets of work can't be sustained because they can't be funded. Um, we used to be very involved in um, odontonate prenatal clinics. 
I must get the wrong one. Our <laughs> antenatal clinics, yeah. Uh, so we used to go to those mother and toddler groups. For instance, within the trust that I work in, we still do that. We still have some involvement for the Sure Start. But I'm aware that throughout Northern Ireland, so many of those Sure Start groups were pulled back. Mm-hmm. Again, you're relying on local people who almost, you, you, you actually maybe become a pain to people that you keep going and going and going until they take it on. But because we don't have that overarching strategy to hang our hat on, it's, it's, it's increasingly difficult. In England, they had a big campaign called the Dental Check by One to encourage registration, to encourage people to take their child along at the early age before before the age of one to the dentist. That has made a big difference there. We have nothing like that. We have very little engagement with health visitors, district nurses, community midwives anymore. And we need that overall strategy to bring things together. Thank you. Thank you. Chair. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Caroline, and thanks for, for the follow-up. Um, my sister's a dentist, so I don't know if that's a declaration of interest. <laughs> just just, well, just to put that on, on record, thank you. We'll assume you're very good we to Jerry. We won't you, Jerry. <laughs> Please don't uh, comment on that. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's very concerning to hear about the morale being very low. That's that's worrying, um, and the, the, the sort of the, the bad. Uh, oral health figures uh, are concerning, and it's worrying, but not surprising, the fact that it's people with, you know, from depraved areas that are the, the most impacted by that. Um, two real questions. Uh, the first is, have you done any? I know you're very uh, overstretched and working very hard, but has there been any research done about the impact of universal credit on uh, dental health? Because I'm aware of one case in particular in my constituency where uh, somebody had to fill out, I think it's a HC1 form, yeah. Um, yeah. and they didn't know that form existed, didn't know what to do, and as a result, they were uh, charged uh, quite a bit of money uh, for the dental work. So, um, I mean, I'm concerned if there, there's another buyer put in place for people, it could lead to an increase in already bad uh, oral health um, sort of figures. And I just want to ask you any comments on that or any research uh, on that. Um, the other question is around the coronavirus. I mean, is there anything that um, you feel the department should be doing but isn't? Uh, is there anything that um, um, dentists or dental practitioners could do, but don't have facilities to do. Uh, so just kind of an open question about coronavirus. Uh, I'd probably take the universal credit one. Uh, <laughs> the you're right. Universal credit is going to be a barrier to access to dental care. Um, patients, when they come in, they have to sign a form which declares what exemption they have. Um, if they can't sign any of those areas or uh, if they're on universal credit, they're not automatically entitled to free care. So they have to fill in a DA or uh, HSC1, which is about the size of the telephone directory, and it's a very complicated form to fill in. Um, We used to be able to advise people, you know, which part of the form to sign and to tick. But it's become so complicated that we we now just say to people, if you don't have proof of exemption, you must take the box that we haven't seen it. Uh, And and it it is a barrier. Uh, I don't think there's been any work done on it, but we're hearing anecdotally from dental practices that people don't know whether they're exempt anymore. People who have been exempt for 20 years suddenly are going, why why do I have to pay? Hmm. Now, they should get the money back through the system, but Either they fill in the HC1 form before they get the treatment, appear for treatment, or they come, they get the treatment, they pay for the treatment, they fill in the HC1 form, and then they get reimbursed from the uh, uh, DHSS. Just on, my concern is twofold: the fact that it's so big, and, yeah. and the fact that I think a lot of people don't know they have to fill it out. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, no, it's one, uh, absolutely. It's, it's one thing putting the barrier in place, yeah. the big yeah. uh, booklet, yes. but also people yeah. not knowing that they have to do it, and, and who does that for them if they're not able to? It's, it's very concerning. Chair, if I could maybe add to that, I mean, through the office, we have had calls from practitioners who, you know, people are present and they aren't aware that they should have the certificate with them, and they're just cancelling their appointments and they're going going home and. You know, there seems to be an awareness issue that you need this certificate before you kind of come along for your treatment, and that's something we've asked the board to feed into, you know, in any sort of promotional works. But we haven't, we're not aware of any evidence of that as such. So there is an awareness issue, I would say. We've also had a, a, a couple of practitioners who have tried to help people, uh, got it wrong, and they've ended up with letters from probity. Then why did you? 
do this. Presumably, dentists aren't trained to do that. No, we're yeah. not. There's a, que- there's a question of having the time to do it as well, so who does that? Uh, that's a very good question. I, I mean, what we do is we you now refer them to the local the HNSS office for, for help to fill in the form. And they will help. They're, they are very, very good. But it's a barrier. There's no doubt about that. It's a barrier. Thank you. Um, Sinead? Thank you, Chair. Um, that's quite worrying, actually. And, and I, I will move on to um, give you the opportunity to speak a little bit about the COVID-19. Because, okay. But I want to reassure you, I have heard everything else and those other everyday issues. But I suppose there is, um, in terms of the business model that is a dentist practice, Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure, and I know it's a live ever moving debate, so there was yesterday talk about the budget and rates relief, and I know there's conversations happening within the executive on whether that's possible or not um, going forward. And I presume, would I be right to presume that um, dentist surgeries would come under that in terms of the, the rates Possibly we already relief. get rates reimbursement. Uh, fully. Fully. Yeah, okay. uh, well, depending on your health service commitment, right. you have to okay. you have to have a certain percentage health service commitment. If you're over 85 percent health service committed, you get full rates reimbursement, okay. which is then every 10 percent that you fall below that. It's well, that's reassuring to hear. So then I'll move into because your day-to-day practice is about um, if you have people in the chair having uh, dentistry work done, then you get paid essentially and if they're not there a large part of your work will be yes. that there is no income to cover your fixed costs of opening the door yeah. turning on the lights the heat pen staff yeah. and and that's i suppose then uh, just to, to have a full understanding of that model that you're working to so it's good to hear that the rates relief yeah. is there and that's a less pressure on you um, so it is then i suppose in terms of understanding your ask in the event of trying to project forward in COVID-19, and, 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 and I know it isn't always good that we're le- leaning into the worst case scenario, but I suppose we have to yeah. have an understanding of what that would look like um, to make sure that any measures or help that was get directed towards you would have a real impact to be able to keep the doors open at the end of this. Yeah. That's, I, I would love to be able to answer the question. I can yeah. give you the business model. What happens within dental practice? So we are paid through three basic ways. The, the first way, as you described, is item of service, and that needs a patient in the chair, and whatever treatment they get done, we claim through the business services organisation. Uh, the second one is we pay, we get paid a certain amount uh, of continuing care and capitation payments. So uh, if you have the capitation payments are for children, so most of children's dentistry is by capitation. So you get paid a certain amount depending on the age of the child and deprivation areas and things like that. You also get paid a certain amount for adults. It's a much smaller sum because the majority of the payments come through on the item of service. We also get a certain number of allowances. uh, The chair alluded to the practice allowance, which is the very big one, which goes to all uh, practice owners. And it it can amount to, in a health service committed practice, 11% of your practice income. But as you put out, if there is no practice income, 11% of nothing is still nothing. Um, so we don't know where we stand. We will still get the capitation and continuing care payments. We will still get a certain number of the allowances, but the majority of the income comes through uh, item of service. And we worry that if practices are told to shut down, there will be nothing in place, and some practices may shut. There is no fat in the system anymore. Chair, just for clarity, the capitation is the children's payment. Is that if the child presents or not? Uh, no, they, they have to come in to be registered, and then they're registered for two years. After two years, the Department of Health takes them off our list again. Uh, so you have to come in at least once every two years to remain registered. Scotland has a slightly different system in that you're, it's like the doctor, you're registered for life. Uh, the capitation payments go down if you haven't presented at the dentist within, I think it's three years. Thank you. Orlea. Thank you, and thanks for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask, yeah, so the rationale, um, the issue came up in the, the chamber a few weeks ago. We had asked a question to Robin Swan around the, the a renewed strategy for oral health. So. Uh, part of the rationale of the department is given was drawn it back to you know that the targets have been met from 2007. There has been improvements. 
but it was just interesting when um, you had mentioned the um, that 65 per cent of under fours um, that, that, that are sorry that, that aren't registered yeah. with with a dentist so it would just be interesting to probe that a wee bit more you know because of the department saying based on a 2007 strategy that they are meeting the target are they meeting the need you know and, and that's the important thing that, yeah. that we need to focus on particularly around the, the health inequalities that deprived areas are already you know suffering um, so much as a result of that so um, the question then was around um, the working groups that you had mentioned. So there's uh, working groups that, that have been set up, or, or the user are waiting for them to be set up around young people and the elderly. So if you could just tell me a wee bit more about those those working groups, why they aren't in place, if, if that's the case. Um, I, I'm not sure if, who, who would chair them. Is there a way of maybe, um, you know, even in the interim, while you're building up, hopefully, to getting a new strategy, is there any steps that we can be taking now to help in the short to medium term? And just the final thing as well, as others were speaking, it was in and around the role of the Department of Education. Um, I, I know oral health is a health issue, but I mean, similar to mental health and, and all the other issues, surely the, the Department of Education would or could have a role in, in helping educate our young people from a young age that would then be a preventative measure no, to look after their oral health. Thank you. Uh, for, <laughs> first bit around the, you're absolutely right. I mean, how can you say that we've reached the targets if you've got 65,000 children who haven't been registered and we actually don't know what the state of their oral health is? So last year we had, for the first time since 2013, a survey of five-year-old children in Northern Ireland. Those, those, that, that survey was done. Um, last year and the results have not yet been made public. We, we don't know the outcome. We have heard various bits and pieces, but nothing, nothing official from the evaluation of that. So, so we, we don't know. But our, I suppose most importantly, as, as you have pointed out, it's these inequalities that have crept in. Uh, and I would probably say that it, the, the, the dental landscape and the population demographics in 2020 are very different to what they were in, t in 2007. Um, you know, I, I, we're talking about our children, but th that doesn't take into account that the massive change in that 13 years that has taken in the increasing elderly population in Northern Ireland. Um, we have dental, adult dental health surveys. Interestingly enough, the dental health surveys in the UK do not examine uh, residents and care homes. So that rising group of population of people with teeth aren't even represented presented in those adult dental health services. So the reality is that the, the scientific evidence, which we, you know, we were sitting and listening to the minister refer to the, the evidence about science for COVID-19, if we don't have that scientific basis to refer to, we don't really have anything of which to plan for. And that's why, as an organisation, we have been pushing so hard about getting this overall oral health strategy. There has been huge resistance to a strategy for reasons that Tristan has outlined that we, we believe are there. Um, I suppose the oral health options groups were, 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 were given to us as a, a method of starting to address those two particularly vulnerable groups. But those groups are under the, the chairmanship, as far as I'm aware, of the chief dental officer. And those groups will not, we have been informed, be going ahead, whilst the chief dental officer is, is not currently at work. Um, the terms of reference for the groups have not been made available. Um, the BDA have representation on the groups. The groups are, are very small, but the chief dental officer had overall say on the representation yeah. of the groups. If I could just briefly add, I mean, the groups, in essence, are ready to go. And one of the meetings, the elderly one, was to have happened tomorrow. Um, and unfortunately, it was cancelled um, due to the illness of the chief dental officer. But there's a wider issue there. You know, the work needs to be able to continue in the capacity within the department, regardless of individuals. You know, the work's got to go on. And these oral health, health options groups, we would love to see them set up. You know, we. As soon we as are possible. I think the go. right people are identified. I think it would produce really good results if we could just get these going. We did offer to write the oral health strategy for you. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> okay, thank you. And in terms of the, the older people I mentioned there, what what about the older people in care settings or residential settings? How how is oral health measured or how is oral health delivered in the, in that okay. demographic? Well, I suppose there's two issues there. There's the oral health delivery and then oral health measurement. If we look at oral health delivery, first of all, um, as I alluded to, there's our you know the the demographic of patients in Northern Ireland is substantially changing, and there are patients are who are still able to attend their general dental practitioner. But largely, or 
more and more uh, happening are these patients are, like my father, in a care home. Um, where access to care is particularly difficult. So the community dental service, but which only comprises less than less than 90 dentists, um, the, the, the uh, assessment of patients and providing oral health advice and prevention is falling to the community dental service. And we are we are are, are stretched beyond belief uh, within the South Eastern Trust where, where, where I, I work. We have over 105 homes in Northern Ireland, and I have. A head count of 17 dentists. Um, you know, it's you don't have to be able to do to do the maths to figure out that we need we need to increase our resources or else adequately fund our colleagues in general dental practice because the reality is community dental services cannot take all of this on. So that's the provision of care, which is 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 patchy. Uh, the other massive problem that we have in relation to to care homes chair is the fact that. Um, Oral health is very far down the, the list of priorities for staff within care homes. We see this time and time and time again. Uh, uh, and there are lots of reasons today. One of the reasons cited is the rapid turnover of staff within care homes. Healthcare assistants leave jobs rapidly. We, as a, a service, try to provide training where the care homes give us access to provide that training. But it's very often my staff will turn up to provide training in a care home, uh, and one, one healthcare assistant turns up and, and they're pulled away after half an hour. And how hard, hard does my father, your relatives in a care home, how are they being catered for? They, 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 most of them are unable to manage their own uh, oral hygiene and cleaning. So there's a massive gap there, which through the elderly oral health options group, we were hoping to be able to address in terms of looking at hopefully the, set of the community dental force workforce, which again has been delayed also, and looking at ways in which colleagues uh, in, through general dental practices, where the, the majority of dentists are based and the majority of dental service staff are based, are able to be remunerated sufficiently in a, in a way to promote prevention and also to go in and look after these patients and provide the treatment. Because the reality is, when an elderly person with teeth enters a care home, it's like falling off the edge of a cliff. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, just from a general point, practice point of view, um, I have always done domiciliary visits uh, throughout my whole career. The first one I ever did was in 1984 in a care home in Dungannon, where there were 20 residents and one standing tooth between the 20 <laughs> residents. If I went into the same equivalent care home, at least 19 of those residents would have some, if not most, of their own natural mm -hmm. teeth. They have very heavily filled dentitions. We, unfortunately, are part of what they, they call the heavy metal generation, and it's not to do with music. Uh, they have crowns, they have bridges. Some of them have implants now, and those need a lot of looking after. And if they're not looked after, they go downhill very, very quickly to a situation where the treatment is almost certainly a general anaesthetic. And clearances. Again, it's where you, if you spend a, a penny on prevention and training, you'll save pounds down the line because those, those patients are really, really difficult to treat when you let them get into that state. So what's the, you stop them getting into that state. I still do uh, quite a few domiciliary visits and when you go into a, a, a care home residence room, it's like entering a sweet shop. We need to get something out of the the Northern Ireland psyche that every time you visit a relative, you have to bring them a sweet treat. Bring them something else, for goodness sake. You know, you're doing them no good at all. And also, my mother is uh, great. She's 93, and uh, she thinks a cup of tea is too wet without a cake or a biscuit or a little bun. You're here. here. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. You're going well with my mum. Yeah. But we, we kind of somehow have to change around that, because I go into care homes, and if you go there at mealtimes, there's always a cake, there's always a biscuit, there's always something. And it's that little bit of sugar throughout the day that causes the decay. So it's, it's, there's, there's a, a definite training need there. The skills are there, Chair, the you know, our fluoride varnish project which I told you about, I mean, it had the potential to, to make things longitudinally different, but there's nothing gonna work overnight. But it takes there's all stakeholders involved here, particularly in relation to the elderly. It's the dental service but much wider. It's the care home providers, it's our QIA as the inspectors. There's a minimum standard there for oral care which on vast majority of our QIA inspections are not looked at. Also That's the, just a, a real missing link. There's a buyer, one of the members of one of our committees on Friday, who did domiciliary visits to care homes, 
Um, because he was one of the few who was doing it, he got a, a property inspection because he was an outlier and he was doing more of these than anybody else. And he said, look, these don't make me any money at all. I'm doing them because of a community service, but if they're going to get me a property investigation, I'm going to stop doing them. So you have these stupid barriers in place. Yeah, listen, I think that was a very, very interesting presentation. I think maybe it would suggest that as a committee we write and ask the, the department why they're not progressing a new dental health strategy, what their rationale is around that, but also I think why those working groups aren't meeting. I think, I think it would be very interesting to find out. I think there's a, because there's clearly huge issues of, of deprivation here, and I know there are figures, and, and it would be useful to, to, to see the figures maybe at, some other, at, at a later stage in terms of where the levels of deprivation are, what the figures are across different thrusts and things like that. But would members agree that we write to the department and seek further information on those two okay. specific issues around, around the strategy and the, uh, the working groups? Agreed. Okay, thank you for coming thank along on very, very short notice. Thank and thank you. you. Thank you very much for taking us. Okay, okay, all the best. Now stay at home. Okay, members, thank you. So we're now moving on to SL1 Food Information Amendment Regulations 2020. I refer the members to pages 117 to 122 of the pack. The Department is proposing to make a statutory rule to enable the enforcement of and provide penalties for non-compliance with certain EU regulations, laying down specific labelling requirements where the country of origin of a primary ingredient is not the same as the given origin of the food itself. Um, the SR is proposed to come into operation on 1st of April 2020 and is subject to nev negative resolution. So, are members content that the department makes the statutory rule? Chair, can I just make a point? And I know this is my last meeting, and I don't want to sound like a broken record, but see in future for all of these SLs, um, SL ones, can they all provide information on the south? What the position is in the south? All of them have provided. Um, what is it, the position, the position in GB or position in Great Britain, Great Britain? But none of them have anything about the South unless we go and ask for it. So maybe to make the thing a wee bit more streamlined, could the department provide us with that information along with the SL1? Um, and I know I said this is my last meeting, but I think it's helpful for all of the committee to have that information. Yeah, and I think that there are real issues there, I suppose, around the fact that we have a very harmonised food yeah. production market okay, and if yeah. the regulations start to diverge in any in any sense. Yeah. So kind of, yeah. Yeah. Maybe just chair just to add that if you just add the line where possible in case there are I don't know what issues there might be. It's okay to, to ask for it I'm sure. Yeah. Or maybe we're relevant if the if you want to add yeah, something. I think the relevant but, yes, we're, yeah. we're relevant or yeah. But just to or save time, we're having to go back and forward, just give us the information up front. The chair, it would be good. I, I fully concur, and I think it would be good to state whether, whether relevant or not, to state that there is none. Yeah, not even. just eliminate it altogether. Because mm. it would be reassuring to know there is none, nothing yeah. to con be concerned about. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, so, will we ask the department to come back with that, with the information in relation to that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So moving on to number seven, the recovery of health service charges amounts regulations amendment regulations NA twenty twenty. I refer members to pages one two four to one two six of the pack and to hard copies of correspondence received yesterday afternoon. Can I remind members that the committee considered this SL one at its meeting on twenty seventh February and deferred its decision pending further information from, from the department. The minister's letter, which is in hard copy, has advised us that EU-wide reciprocal arrangements exist and that further information will be provided in due course in relation to the system in Britain, which is similar. So, in the interim, the Minister is asking the Committee to agree that the statutory rule be made in order to avoid a loss of income to the Health Service. The Committee would still have the opportunity to agree or not agree the SR itself when it comes before us. So, are members content that the Department makes the statutory rule? Chair, can I just ask, so are we being asked to pass this without all of the information? Yeah, the, the information is incomplete, I think is the... Is that what it is? Yeah, go ahead, Ash. I could just advise, so this is just an infl inflationary uplift, so all that this is doing is applying an inflationary amount 
think I seem to recall it might be one percent. It's a very small percentage. Mm -hmm. Ensure the health service can recover costs in respect of uh, uh, treatment of those injured in a car accident from an insurance company. So the outstanding piece of information that was the, any significant differences with the GB system. The original paperwork says they have a similar system in GB. Yeah. Usually that's code for nothing of note. Okay. It's different, but we've asked to confirm the detail of any differences. So that's the bit of information that hasn't come back. But you could still object to the rule at a later point. But at the moment, if we proceed, it would allow the inflationary increment preparation to go ahead to ensure no, no money is lost from the health service. And it will come back to us as an it SR comes back for as final. An SR, yeah. okay. come back as an SR. So are members content that the department makes the statutory rule? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. SR 2020-25, the provision of health services to persons not ordinarily resident, amendment regulations, NA 2020. I refer members to pages 128 to 133 of the pack. This SR will enable visitors to the north to receive hospital treatment for coronavirus disease free of charge to ensure that the risk to public health from symptomatic visitors is minimised. The committee considered this uh, at our meeting on the 5th of March and we approved the SL1 policy document. There have been no changes to policy content since the SL1 was submitted to us last. And the examiner of statutory rules advises that the SR is in breach of the 21-day rule, but that the examiner is content with the department's reason for that, and that they have no other issues to raise. So, have members any issues they wish to raise in connection with that? If not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020/25, the provision of health services to persons not ordinarily resident, amendment regulations NA 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Mm -hmm. Okay, members, moving on to correspondence then. Can I refer you to pages 137 to 180 of the correspondence memo and to uh, at pages 135 to the, the correspondence memo at pages 135 to 136 and to your table papers. And I'd like to draw your attention, members, to several items. Firstly, item 9.2 is a departmental response regarding further information in respect of the mental health support for those affected by the neurology patient recall. Are members content to note the department's response? Yep. Content. Mm -hmm. Item 9.3 is a departmental response regarding the soft opt-out system for organ donations. Are members content to note <clears throat> the response and agree to forward it to the Donate for Die campaign for information? Uh, um. Chair, yes, but um, I think we should be going back to the department and asking, um, because obviously they talked about um, what happened in 2016 at the Assembly and the duty on the department uh, to promote transplantation and increase awareness about transplantation and the donation of human organs. So I think we should be going back to them and asking them, you know, have they have they done this? Have they raised awareness? Have they um, you know, given that there's a statutory duty to do so? So what have they done, and, and what the, what has the result been since then? What is, what's the difference? Yeah. And further, I would suggest, uh, having read the response, I thought it was hard to figure out what exactly was being planned or what was yeah. being actioned as happening. Would members be content that we maybe bring that to our forward planning day to have a look yeah. and see how we might Absolutely. impact on that going forward? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, content with that. Thank you. Item 9.5 is a request from a parent curer to brief the committee in relation to engagement issues with health bodies. Um, quite, a, quite a long submission. Are members content, given the extensive detail provided, that we note this correspondence to inform future engagement on accountability and governance? Yeah. And I think it's also notable that the, the centre of that is with, with the link to hyponatremia maybe be included in our stakeholder, any further stakeholder engagement that we would do in that issue, just for nothing. Okay, so are members otherwise content with the proposed actions as noted in the correspondence memo? Thank you. Moving on then to table papers. Item 9.12 of table papers is correspondence from the Minister of Health regarding the introduction of a legal framework for access to abortion services in the North. Are members content to note? Sure. Jerry Forst and then. Chair, sure, just quickly, can I propose that we add uh, that we get a briefing from the NIO on this because I understand some groups have tried to meet them and for some of them it's been difficult. Um, um, so, yeah, I would like to propose that in, re in regards to this, we have the NIO brief us as soon as possible. 
Members' views on that proposal? I actually had that down as something to raise today, so I would certainly support that. Yeah. Members' sure. content? Okay, I wouldn't have any objection to that. I just wanted to say I have quite a number of questions coming out of that, so that can be dealt with that, or we can ask them individually anyway. But I have yeah. various okay. issues about even in terms of clarification as to um, what role um, the Northern Ireland the Northern Ireland Assembly has in uh, the regulations coming forward and whether uh, where the cost is coming to uh, implement those regulations as well. And that will tally with so our members broadly agreed that we asked for a briefing on that? Yep. Mm-hmm. Sure, it, it's quite timely obviously with the 31st of March fast approaching so that issue. Okay, yep. okay thank you. So, item 9.13 is a response from the Minister to an email from, from myself requesting the Chair requesting information on COVID-19 preparations from the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer. Are members content to note that? Yep. Thank you. Item 9.14 is correspondence from the Department of Health regarding the launch of the Nursing and Midwifery Task Group report together with a copy of the report. Are members content to note pending further scrutiny of workforce issues? Sure, just on that one, um, I, I'm conscious of the table papers. The members were getting them at sort of short notice, and, and there was a lot within that report. I genuinely didn't get the time to filter through it. There may be things arising from it. Um, so I'm not sure what way the committee, the process for tabling papers, I'm not sure what that, that process is or how we prioritise what comes through. But um, just sometimes with the short notice, it's difficult to you know, digest what's what's contained, especially when it's more of a lengthy report. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure if there's and better it was way Just for members' information, ordinarily, um, if a matter is not um, on your agenda or is not um, urgent, we would hold it back sometimes for the following week, um, where we know that it's an issue that you have been looking at, and we knew the minister was coming, and we knew that you could, you would be having your, you've already agreed you would like to have the Royal College of Nurses and this is an ongoing issue. We included it so with the suggestion that perhaps it would be considered at a further meeting, so you're okay. not necessarily under that pressure. So I appreciate that's very difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly, you know, happy to talk further about that to anyone uh, to whom that's causing a concern. Okay, so happy to Thank note you, that. Yep. Item 9.15 is the fourth report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules. May I remind members that the committee considered SR 2020 forward slash 23 public health notifiable diseases order 2020 at last week's meeting and agreed it had no objection to the rules subject to the examiner of statutory rules report. The examiner of statutory rules advises in her report that the SR is in breach of the 21 day rule, but that the examiner is content with the department's reason for this again and has no other issues to raise. So are members content to note the examiner of statutory rules report? Yeah. Yeah. Forward work programme then, can I refer members to the draft forward work programme at pages 182 to 183 of the pack? Uh, are con- members content to note the forward work programme? Jerry? Sure, thanks. Just under uh, 10.2, I obviously raised, I think it was last week, about the action meetings in regards to the coronavirus. Um, mm. I don't know, ex- next week we'll have our... Coming come, come okay. on that next item, Jerry. Coming on that next item. So are members content to note the forward work programme as it sits there at the present? Okay. So can I also refer members to the clerk's memo then at pages 184 to 186 of the pack on options to ensure dedicated committee time is available to consider COVID-19? And I asked the clerk to draw up this memo in, in relation to the discussion we had last week in that. So um, I think you have all had the chance, I hope, to see the, to see the options paper and I just throw it open there for a discussion around what, what our members think we proceed on that, on that basis. Yeah, Jerry, and then earlier. Thanks, sorry, Chair, I was too eager there. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not uh, sort of uh, precious on a particular day. I just think we should have as much time as, as feasibly possible. I mean, I think there's going to be new legislation coming through, uh, as, as the Minister indicated. Um, so I, I would just like to propose we have a day where we'll have a, a fair bit of time to go through um, what's coming through and um, to scrutinise what's coming through and you know, make sure that. You know, we're, we are reassuring the public we're doing everything we can to support but also to scrutinise any measures in place. So I'm not sort of beholden to any particular day myself, but I would like to have as much time as possible, um, whenever that is. Okay. Or Leah, then Pam. 
Um, yes, and I'm, I'm fully in agreement that you know we should um, do all that we can to, to stay close to this issue and stay on top of it. Um, my only issue would be on a Thursday, I've public accounts in here right after the health committee, so the Thursday afternoons um, wouldn't work for me, but I'm happy to, you know, whatever suggestions members want to go for. I know today we had we brought our meeting forward to the 10 o'clock. I don't know if that would be an option, having an additional meeting on the back of the an earlier health meeting on a Thursday morning. Um, but if people have other other ideas, but just that Thursday afternoon would be would be out for me. And I know people are going to be tied up with other committees on a Wednesday as well, and chambers Mondays and Tuesdays. So just whatever suits with with everyone else. Um. Yeah, Chair, I was I was going to say that I agreed with the Thursday afternoon, but if that's going to be an issue for well more than or there, um maybe we could look at just looking at the timing of it. Obviously, we need to be conscious of the uh, committee staff and the pressure, the work pressure on them as well. So I think if we can keep it to to the one day, however we make that work, I think that would probably work better because it's very difficult. I, I don't see any point in trying to move to like a Tuesday lunchtime. It will, I think, just be um, bedlam. It's already pretty hectic with all, mm. with all the other meetings that are going on. Sinead, yeah. Sorry, Chair, could I add the fact that we do meet on a Thursday, um, perhaps even just to just keep it on the agenda, and even if it meant meeting half an hour earlier, if there was an agenda item that warranted it. Yeah. Um, and I note that there was some consideration given to the provision of remote access, because I'm really conscious going forward of quorum, um, and I'm not sure if this room has access to audio. Um, in terms of then, if we did, you know, have an earlier meeting where somebody could come in remotely for that piece, because I'm very conscious the minister has indicated and we're aware that legislation will have to be passed, and I presume this committee may have a role to play in that. Um, it may not be, maybe that there's other routes uh, to to doing that, but I just think that to commit a block of time on a Thursday might be the, the most swift way of getting this on the agenda every week, instead of having to grind every individual person to find out when it suits. Yeah. Are members content with that proposal, that we keep it on as a regular? That was something I was thinking of that, mm. would, that would, I think that would be appropriate that we put it on. I also think the fact that we have indicated that we expect the committee will have input into that it's, it's important that we do have extra mm -hmm. flexibility and availability. Um, so members content with, with that, of putting it on as a, as a standing item. Mm -hmm. um, and I think any decision we make in relation to additional meetings, we should keep under review, you know, just just in general, so that as the situation develops, that we are we are alert to to how that may need to either be, um, and, and we'll also be alert to the people who will be presenting to the committee in terms of their time and, and what what they're involved in. So I think we'd also keep any any plan under review. In terms of the practicality of moving to earlier on a on a say potentially earlier on a Thursday. Have it as a standing item on the agenda. Run, run the meeting, run an additional session, and and either at a separate meeting, where if we had to move room, or could we facilitate it here, Ailish? Do you know, or could you check? Um, so, there is uh, availability in the afternoon um, from two in room twenty nine fortnightly, and room twenty one in the altern in the in between week. Uh, room twenty nine has all the facilities this room has. But room 21 has audio feed, but not the video streaming. So uh, for people wanting to listen in, they could listen in, but they couldn't see uh, the video of the committee session at that time. Um, does that answer your question? Sorry. Well, it, well, it doesn't. It doesn't. Could we? Could we? Could we move our meeting forward, say, to half nine? Meet to meet to meet to say. Meet to twelve, break for lunch, say for, for half an hour, and back for do a meeting from one to two. That would allow them do an addition. Would that be? Yes, we have this room available, um, but PIC needs this room from two p.m. So then we need about fifteen minutes before to allow the changeover. Would that be an hour, sorry, for the, the coronavirus item. On its own. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So we facilitate the hour either at the start of the meeting or, or in that in that second slot, depending on availability of, of people who would be coming. But to give us an additional an additional time to focus on that issue, and in light of that, also I have been kind of and we've been discussing and considering the planning day, and we're in light of where the minister is indicating we're at the present time, it may be an idea for us to defer that planning day to a later stage to allow us to free us up to work on the issues that are going to be most prevalent. Would members agree that that's a, 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 
mm-hmm. a, a legitimate thing to do at this point in time, just to yep. just to make sure we're, we're focused, and also to give the proper, I think, attention to the forward work, which is very important, mm-hmm. that it doesn't get lost within all of the other considerations, which may be which may be on hand next week or over the next number of weeks. So we give it the proper space. So can I propose that we defer that till uh, for a number of weeks anyway, potentially till after Easter? But sure, I was going to suggest even if if it was in any way useful, you could even do it at a at a different time and just keep it within the building. If that's if that's something going to work, you know, if it's, well. I just think events might kind of overtake us yeah. um, in terms of dealing with COVID nineteen and stuff. And I think, and it's good to have. I'm glad Jerry did raise um, uh, that topic, and we're going to put it on the agenda. And I think we shouldn't limit ourselves to whatever time we need. To yeah. deal with the issue, we need to deal with that. It's not kind of times up or move on. I think um, it, obviously we need to prioritise in terms of version, so you what, whatever the subject is. Yeah. But if it, if it, if it was useful, if it's not going, if it's not maybe going to be practical to do what you would normally do and go out for a planning day somewhere, maybe it would be easier simply to have a um, I don't know a quicker version and. Well, we, can, we, can, we can look at that Pam, I suppose, and review it this time. We, yeah. we can keep it under review, I suppose. I am keen that the committee goes out, and that's one that I would be, but I think, I think you're right, we just need to be, keep it under review and see, see how things are working. Yeah. There may be opportunities to do particular sessions of the work, of the, the forward work planning here as well, yeah. you know, maybe, maybe around specific items mm-hmm. that, would, that would advance that or, or leave us in a better position. So are members content with that, um, that, that we're going to facilitate that extra, that extra time? Okay. Any other business then today? Sorry, Chair, just about the um, remote access to a meeting in terms of the IT infrastructure to facilitate that. In terms of working from home, potentially? Yes, about if anybody, just in t- trying to reach a quorum. Yeah. You know, Is that something that can be explored? I can't report anything formally yet, but okay. I know that all of these matters yeah. are under consideration, so hopefully okay. we'll be able to report back. Well, Chair, I did um, raise it with the Commission, and I know they're doing some testing today. And with feedback, and I also raised it with procedures in case there was anything to prevent a quorum being achieved by somebody remotely accessing. But I understand it is in our gift as a committee to decide how we meet, so yeah. that shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, just in terms of any other business, I just want to acknowledge that this is very likely to be Gemma's last meeting as a member of the Health Committee. I think she's moving on mm-hmm. uh, after Monday in, in terms of committee work. So I'd just like to thank Gemma for her contribution to our committee in the, in the short space of time you've had here with us. Thank you very much. I just want to thank all of you. It's been a pleasure working with you all. Um, and it was a very interesting committee, but I'm moving on. He's going to do coronavirus. <laughs> OK. So date, time and place of next meeting, I suppose... Um, the next meeting then, in light of the decision we made on the forward work round, that will mean that our next meeting will be back here next week, and we look at 9.30. 9.30 next week start for, the, for this meeting. Okay, so uh, the meeting will take place here at 9.30 next week. Thank you. The meeting is now closed. Sure. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber. Programme signed.